What's going on everybody? Welcome back to another video. Today, we're gonna to be learning Excel for data analytics in under three hours. Now, Excel is just one of those skills that everybody expects you to know. And so you just don't wanna know the very basics. You kinda of wanna go in depth and really understand it well. And so that's what we're gonna be doing in this lesson. We're gonna be really diving in. We're gonna be taking a look at so many different things. So we'll be starting out with some of the more simple things and working to more advanced things, but we'll be looking at conditional formatting, pivot tables, lookups, data visualization, data cleaning, and more. So without further ado, let's jump onto my screen and get started. All right, so let's jump right into it on this home tab right here. If we go all the way over to the right, there is conditional formatting and the description that it gives us is easily spot trends and patterns in your data using bars, colors, and icons to visually highlight important values. And that is exactly how I would have defined it. Uh, really good job, Microsoft, exactly how I would have done it. So what you'll see right away is there's nothing too complex. So we have some highlight cell rules. Um, we have some top bottom rules, data bars, color scales, icon sets, and then at the bottom, we can create a rule, we can clear the rule, and we can manage our rules. So if you create a rule, then you can manage it. So we're gonna start with these icon sets, and I'm gonna show you how to use those, and we'll work our way to the top, and then I'll show you how to create some rules yourself and how that all works. So let's start off with the icon sets. I'm gonna go over here to sales. Um, and for this data, we kind of have this, um, you know, trend or, or pattern that you can kind of see over time. So over the months. Um, so if we go right here and let's use that conditional forming, let's use that icon sets. And right here, we can use these directional. So, you know, we have this kind of time series of each month that shows us how much paper they're selling. And if we do this right here, it's gonna show us if it's kind of average or if it's below average or if it's above average or if it's going up. So at a really quick glance, you can kind of see the pattern of this data set. It's kind of going mostly yellow and red. There's only two months where it's going up significantly. Now we don't have to only do that for one row or one column. You can apply it to all of them, but as you can see, all of these are red. Now, why are they all red? It's because they're using numbers for everything. So they're comparing these 24s and these 50s and 65s against these 450s and 750s. And so they're all going to be red. But if we do it individually, if we do it each row, if we take it just like this and then we go to icon sets and do it, it's going to be much more representative of the actual printers, not of all the numbers as a whole. And you can do other things. Uh, the arrows are ones that you'll probably see the most often. That's the one I've used if I ever do use them. Um, but you can, you know, do ones like this where they have, you know, kind of a trend upward or a trend downward. Um, and so there's just several more arrows. This one only gives you three. As you can see, this one gives you five. Um, and you can do you know, colors or shapes or, or different indicators and all these different things. Um, and honestly, it's kind of whatever you want to use, whatever makes sense for your data. But, you know, I've really only ever seen like these colors being used. I've never really seen these flags or anything like that. But again, it just depends on what industry you work in. Uh, you might you might see that. Let's go right over here to the demographics um, and let's look at our color scales. Now, color scales are going to be the probably the most obvious thing that in data bars are going to be the most obvious things in here. Um, if you go right here and, and you look at this color scale, if it's high, if it's among the top ones, it's green, the lowest, it's red. And you can change that um, to really any colors you want, any colors that they offer you. Um, and it, it it does exactly what it does. It's a color scale, a gradient of the colors from high to low or low to high. And so any color that you do, you'll be able to kind of see, um, you know, what's good and what's not good. That really is um, <laughs> color scales in a nutshell. Data bars are again, super, super straightforward. It's going to be either a gradient fill or a solid fill. So let's look at the gradient fill. If we do a blue gradient fill, uh, actually let's get rid of our, um, Let's go over here. Let's go to clear rules from selected cells. We haven't looked at that yet, but that's how you clear it. Let's go to data bars and we'll use this blue gradient. So with this blue gradient, you know, this one is, or sorry, this one is the highest one. So it's going to be completely filled. And this one is 36,000, almost half of this um, pretty close. And so it's almost half um, this one again, you know, 
It's not used very often. I, you don't see these a lot, to be honest. You just don't. Um, but if you do see it, that's how you use it. And that's how it can be done. Again, pretty easy. Uh, as I just showed a second ago, if you want to clear the rules, you can clear it from the selected cells. That's what we're doing. So I have column G selected, and I'm going to I'm gonna clear that. If you want to clear the rules of the entire sheet, you can do that as well. So it would affect every single column and row. We'll just do this for now. So now let's go look at the top bottom rules. So this is the top 10 items, top 10%, bottom 10 items, bottom 10%, above average and below average. And they're going to do exactly what you think they are going to do. If you select above average, it is going to select or highlight the cells that are above the average in column G. So let's look at the salaries that are above average. All right. And so uh, the ones that are at the very top are Michael Scott's, Toby Flenderson's and Dwight Schrute. Uh, no shock there. Um, I believe the average is somewhere around like 48,500 or something. So I think this one just is just below it. And so all these other ones are below average. And that's just because, you know, Michael Scott and Dwight Schrute are, are and Toby are kind of bringing up that average quite a bit. So everyone else is going to fall beneath that. And so at a super quick glance, you're able to just highlight the cells and you're able to see who is above average. And, you know, you can do this in a lot of different ways in Excel, but this is just a really simple, fast way to do that. Um, let's get rid of that real quick and let's go back up here. And now we can, oops, let's go to top bottom rules. And now we can see the below average and it's going to highlight all the other ones. And so it works exactly how you think it is going to work. And this is the default way that it highlights these cells. So it highlights them this kind of um, see through red and then it highlights the actual text or the, or the um, characters in there red as well. Now, I'm not going to go through and show you every single one of these top bottom rules. I think they're pretty self-explanatory. I just kind of wanted to show you what happens when you do use one of them. It's going to highlight that cell. So let's go up here to the highlight cells rules. And honestly, these are the ones that I use by far the most. Uh, all these other ones combined, I do not use more than this highlight cells rules. Um, and the one in here that I use more than any other conditional formatting rule is this duplicate values. So I'll start with that really quick and I'll kind of show you a few of these other ones. But this duplicate values to me is one of the most useful ones. Um, and so let's kind of show you how that works. If you go to the start date, you can see that we have a duplicate value right here. And if we go over here to conditional formatting, highlight cells rules and duplicate values, it is going to highlight um, the uh, duplicate and that says duplicate right here. Now we can go through here and click on unique um, and then it would highlight all the ones that are not duplicates. Um, so you can use it, you know, kind of in a similar inverse way. Uh, it's just different, different, but I use the duplicate almost always. Um, another thing that you can do is go over here and you can change the color um, or you can even do a custom, um, which I almost never do that. It's not um, something I spend a lot of time doing. I typically just stick with this one. So you can do that and it's going to highlight, um, you know, something that has a duplicate value in there. Now, why do I use this so much? Well, I work with a lot of different types of data sets, but one thing that you'll find in almost all of them is they have some type of ID and they're going to have some type of, um, personal information, whether that's a social security number or an address or, um, you know, or a cell phone number or something like that, there is going to be data that is going to identify that person. Now, I work a lot with pharmaceutical data, a lot with pharmacy data, um, as well as healthcare data. So like names, social security numbers, addresses, phone numbers, all of those things, all that customer or, or client information. And oftentimes when I get a new data set and I have it in Excel or I convert it to Excel, I will start using these duplicates to try to find issues with the data and I find them all the time. Either there's an employee ID or some type of customer ID or client ID that has a duplicate in there that should not be in there or there's multiple social security numbers or there's an issue in some other way and I'm able to find those things and spot those patterns using this duplicates. And I promise you, I use this one almost every single time I open a new data set or I work with a new client working with their data. Um, and so I wanted to show you this one. I wanted to really press upon you that this one is a really, really, really good one to know and learn how to use. 
it's not complicated. It's not hard. It just shows you, you know, you know, if there's a duplicate value, but I wanted you to know how I use it and how often I use it so that you can, you know, pick that up and put that in your toolkit in your back pocket so that you can use that later on. If you have, uh, if you have a similar need, or if you're trying to do something similar to what I was just talking about. So that is how duplicates work. Again, super great. It's obviously not super useful when you're only using um, 10 rows, but when you have, you know, 50,000, 100,000, and there should be zero duplicates in there and you highlight it, and then uh, you come right here, use the filter, and we're gonna filter and we're gonna sort by the color and it allows you to sort by the color and you have duplicates in there, then that's a problem. Um, and you identified a problem super quickly. Uh, and you know some of those things, they slip by because nobody checks it. And so that's something that I, I often check. And if you go here and you sort by color and there isn't an option to do um, this, this pink red color, then that means there aren't any duplicates and that's a really good thing. Most of the time, that's a really good thing. So let's go ahead and we're gonna clear that as well as get rid of our conditional formatting rules. Now, another one that I use a lot is this one right here, which is the text that contains. Honestly, this one comes a lot in handy, especially when you're looking for like a specific keyword. In my uh, case, a lot of times I was using this when I was going through drug names. I am not a doctor. I do not pretend to be a doctor. And so when I was looking for lorazepam or something like that, um, I would just search for like Loraz or something and, and not Lorax, but Loraz, you know, I, I would just search for it. And then all the ones that contain that would pop up. I can bring them to the top and I can see them. And to me, that's super, super useful. And I would do that all the time. And so in this case, we're looking at emails and let's say we all only wanted to pull all the ones that are Gmail. And so now we can go through and we can, you know, click OK and that's going to pop up or we want all the ones that have Dunder, oops, Dunder Mifflin. And if we click on that, all the ones that are Dunder Mifflin come up or have Dunder Mifflin in it. And again, we can um, sort by, or we can, um, I, and so we can sort by right here and we can bring all those to the top. And so super, super useful. Um, and another use for it that you may not think of is something like if it's, you know, there's some incorrect data in there. This happens often with phone numbers, addresses, um, start dates, or, or, or dates in general, date formats, where you can go in here and you can say text that contains, and if you know you put in a, oops, a dash, and it has it in there, then you know that that is, that is wrong. Now that is really all I wanted to show you in the highlight cells rules. Uh, the duplicate values and the text contains are by far the ones that I use the most. All the other ones I have used, um, these ones not so much, but in these highlight cells rules, I use you know these two all the time. Um, sometimes I use this between. I don't really use these other ones as much, although I have used them. And so if you got nothing else from this video, I just wanted you to know that these two are super useful. And if you haven't used them before, to maybe try them out and see how you can apply them to your own data sets. Now, we've looked at all of these preset ones in conditional formatting. But you can also do a new rule. And so if we click on new rule right here and we go down to use a formula to determine which cells to format, we can add our own formula in here that will then highlight exactly what we want. And so if there isn't a preset rule that you like and it doesn't have the option that you want, you can do almost any formula that you want in our formulas video that we did a few weeks ago. And you can put it in here and then you can format uh, what you want the cell to look like if it meets that criteria. So let's take this right over here. Um, and before we start this formula, I just want you to note that, you know, I, I have H11 highlighted. That's going to come into play in just a little bit. But I wanted you to be aware that H11 is the cell that we're highlighted. So what we're going to do is we are going to create our formula now. If you've never created a formula, I highly recommend uh, watching my formulas tutorial because that is going to show you how to do this. Um, but we're all we're going to do is we're going to do equals. That's how you start the uh, how you actually create a formula. And we're going to give it this range right here. And so it's going to take everything from G2 to G10. Now, these dollar signs are super important. If you don't know how to use them or you don't know what they do, um, you're going to mess up this formula a lot. Uh, and so what this dollar sign basically does is it's basically hard coding it in there. 
it is only going to look at G2 and is only going to look at G10 or through G10 because of that colon. And this can come into play because if you have something selected like the H11, it's going to mess it up because now if you have H11 selected like we do, you'll see this in a second, it's not going to be applied to this. Um, and again, I'll show you that in just a minute, but we don't want this hard coded in there. Okay, but we do have to select the proper range in a second. Um, so we're gonna get rid of this. We're gonna get rid of the dollar signs because we want it to be pretty fluid and be able to apply to be applied basically anywhere we want. Let's go into this formula. Um, if it meets our criteria, let's give it um, let's give it a border, and we'll give it um, we'll give it some color. We're gonna say if this is greater than fifty thousand. So let's hit OK and nothing happened. So let's go back and see why. So if we go to our manage rules, you can see that as still as the G2 to G10 is greater than 50,000, but it only is being applied to this H11 cell, which really makes no sense. Um, so if we had wanted to get it done the first time, we would need to have basically selected that G2 to G10 right away, uh, but we can do that now. So let's get rid of this, and we're gonna say G2 to G10. And that is hard coded in there. That should be fine still, um, but let's see what it does. And so now every single thing is highlighted. And why is that? Uh, that's because when we changed it, it also changed the format of it because we changed the cell that we were looking at. So we need to come back here. And that's why, again, you wanna do this the right way the first time. We're gonna come back here and we're gonna give it this range. And we're gonna get rid of these dollar signs. And now we're going to hit OK. And so now it's being applied G2 to G10 and G2 to G10. And we'll keep it like that and we'll apply it. And now it works properly. So now everything that's above 50,000 is being highlighted. Again, if that was confusing, um, it, it, it is confusing. It genuinely is. And so if you wanted to do this right the first time without having to make a bunch of changes, you'd want to highlight these before you start. And then you want to go in and create the rule. We'll do this really quick just to kind of show you what I'm talking about. We'll say equals, we'll give it this range. We'll get rid of these real quick. Because again, I don't want this hard coded in there. It will ruin our formula. And then we'll say greater than 30. Um, and we'll give it this nice green. Uh, and so now if they're over the age of 30, it will be highlighted and we didn't have to go back and change anything. We didn't have to go back and fix anything like we did in the first one. Um, that was all for demonstration purposes. But again, you need to really be aware of that. That is something that I think almost everybody's gonna mess up at some point. And if you don't already know about it, then you definitely are going to make that mistake. Now, if we come over here in this area, uh, we go to our manage rules and not just the current selection, but this whole worksheet, then you can see that we have these two formulas. Now you can go in and edit any of these by double clicking or clicking on it and then hitting edit rule. You can also delete these rules or duplicate these rules. Um, I just wanted to show you what you are able to do with them. But if we uh, go ahead and we get rid of this, um, so let's say we delete that rule and we hit apply, uh, you know, the rule is going to go away. That's that. I mean, it's as simple as that. So that is how you can create your own rule. I want it to be, again, very specific in the fact that that is a confusing piece. And if you mess that up, you're going to be, you know, fixing a bunch of different stuff and not understanding why your rule is not working properly. It's just because it's confusing. Those dollar signs are, are really important to watch out for. And that is all there is to it with conditional formatting. Again, conditional formatting is, um, you know, it's not anything super confusing. We've looked at more complicated things, but it's a really, really useful tool to use to look at these patterns and trends super quickly and to find um, these outliers or these specific values that you're looking for very quickly. And if you're looking at just thousands and tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of rows, this is one of the fastest ways to find these things without having to kind of wait and filter and use these, um, these, these filters right here. Because again, this can just take forever. Um, and so if you haven't, or if you've never worked with a ton of data and tried to use this before, it, it can take honestly like 10 minutes for something simple that you could do with conditional formatting in like 10 seconds. So definitely something to mess with and use when you are working with your own data sets. 
Uh, I hope this was helpful. I mean, honestly, I use this all the time. So, you know, I'm, I hope that somebody out there can, can use this uh, for their own work that they're currently using. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of myself. We are gonna be looking at something absolutely pivotal in your data analytics career, and that is uh, pivot tables. Uh, and I think that's really appropriate. It is probably one of the most commonly used things I think that data analysts use to convey information in Excel. It's super easy to group things together, to display information in a very easily understandable way, especially for people who are not data analysts, right? I use this a lot for other managers or for higher ups um, who don't want to get into SQL or, or, you know, aren't super tech savvy in like Python or Tableau. They just want it in, in Excel. And so I use it all the time for that reason. And so we're going to be using this data set right here, Bike Store Sales in Europe. I will include this link in the description. Um, we're not going to look at the columns just yet. We're going to download it. Um, I've already downloaded it a few times, <clears throat> but we are going to go to um, our downloads. We're going to open it up and we're going to open up this sales right here and give it a second. All right, perfect. And so here's what it looks like, uh, at least on my screen. I'm going to uh, spread it out just a little bit. Um, and really quickly, let's take a very quick glance at this. So we have a date, a day, a month, a year. So some, um, some date information. Um, then we have some customer age information. So how old was the customer? Again, this is bike sales. So what did, um, you know, what did they buy? Uh, and then we have some demographic information. So this is their age group. We have uh, the gender, the country, state, uh, the product category, the subcategory, the actual product that was purchased. And then we have things like, um, you know, how much these things cost, the quantity that was that was ordered. So we have order quantity, unit cost, unit price. Then we have the profit, cost, and revenue. All things that we, almost everything in here, we can in some way put into a pivot table. Now, I'm not gonna go through every single variation of that, but we are gonna be um, looking at a, a lot of this um, revenue over here, because I think it's it's pretty easy to show the value of a pivot table with, especially with, um, you know, currency or money. So what we're going to do to get started is we're gonna go up to insert, and we're gonna click on insert, and then we are going to click on pivot table. Now, really quick, there is a recommended pivot tables, and if you click on that, what will come up is some recommendations that Excel gives based on the data that you have. Um, and it can kind of give you some ideas of, of what you can do with pivot tables. It's gonna generate it for you. We're not gonna do that, we're gonna build our own, uh, but let's click on pivot table and it's going to auto select basically everything. And that's fantastic. Um, but what if it doesn't come like that, I, I just erase that. If it doesn't come like that, you can click right here you can kick, <clears throat> excuse me, you can click control shift and then the right arrow and then the down arrow. And that is gonna select all of our data. Um, and you have right here a new worksheet or an existing worksheet. We're gonna create a new worksheet. Just tends to get too clogged up if we put it on the same worksheet that already has a lot of data in it. So right over here are pivot table fields and these are all of our columns that we just looked at. And we're gonna be able to select those and kind of drag and drop. Now, if you just took the Tableau um, tutorial series that I just finished doing last week, then this is gonna be pretty familiar. Um, you're gonna start seeing a little bit of, um, hopefully some patterns about how the data is kind of displayed. And so we have our filters down here. We have columns, rows, values. All of these things uh, we will be using, I'll show you how to use today, as well as some additional things. Um, one thing that we want to start with uh, for this demonstration is we're going to be looking at kind of the um, these bottom ones right here, profit, cost, and revenue. And we're going to be doing that per country, uh, per country and state, and we'll kind of do some drill downs, um, and I'll show you how those work. So for just to start out, we're going to take the country right here, and you'll see it populate right over here. In fact, um, let me zoom in maybe once. Uh, yeah, that should be fine. I don't know if I want, I might zoom in it again in just a little bit. Um, so we have our country and, and it's just like this. Very, very simple. Oops. Um, now I'm gonna include the state. Now I'm gonna drag this um, all the way and I'm gonna put it under. You can put it above or you can put it below. I'm gonna put it below. Uh, it definitely makes the most sense there. Now, when you do that, it, it 
um, kind of populates it in an expanded way, but you can collapse this very easily. We're gonna go right here, we're gonna right click, we're gonna go, go down to expand and collapse, and we're going to collapse the entire field. And so now here are all of our, um, all of our countries as they were before, but now each of them has this plus sign to the left. And if you click on it, now we can go and we see this state that we, that we added to these rows. And what this is gonna do is it kind of is like a roll up or it's like a grouping. Um, and so if you, you know, have taken the SQL um, tutorial series and you've done uh, things with group by, this is very similar to that. Um, and if you've done the uh, Tableau tutorial series, it's kind of like a drill down. <clears throat> it's very, very similar. So you can drill into the information. So we um, can put some values in here uh, and what, we're, what that's gonna do is that's going to kind of create some, in, some context to what this what we're grouping by. So just for um, visual purposes, let's add this revenue. So this is the revenue that is bike, uh, bike sales revenue, right? That's what we're looking at. So this is the sum of the revenue for these bike sales per country. Now, if we drop down right here, we can see that in Australia, uh, New South Wales had uh, 92, what is that, 9 million, 203,495 dollars. Queensland had 5 million, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So now we can break it down. We can't, it's, we don't just have to look at Australia. We can now drill down even further to the actual state is what they're calling it. Um, the actual state within Australia. And so it's super, super useful. And you can do that for every single one. And so we can look at Canada, we can look at France, and we can really drill down into uh, the revenue for each of these countries as well as the states within them. Now over here, this is not the most uh, pretty. Um, it just says sum of revenue and then it has some numbers. Not, not the most pretty thing I've ever seen. Um, really quick, we can go like, we can um, kind of highlight over these and we can go back to home. You can do it in a couple different ways. We can go to home and we'll type currency. Now it has these two dot zero zeros at the end. You can get rid of those really easily by going like that. Um, already this looks quite a bit better just visually, um, especially if you're looking at it in uh, you know dollars, you can change the currency um, to different currencies if you want to do that. Now we don't just have to do uh, the sum of revenue, we can do a lot of different things. So let's go to the value field settings. So we can customize this name so we can do um, revenue, oops, be good if I could spell, revenue per country, um, that's fine. That, you know, it's just a placeholder just trying to show you. But we don't have to just do that. Um, you know, we could do the count, the average, the max, the min. We can do just about anything we want. Um, but let's keep it the sum right now. Um, and if we want to, we can show this value as different things. So we percentage, the uh, percentage of column total, percentage of row total. Let's do really quick, just for demonstration purposes, the percentage of grand total. So when we do that, we can see that the United States, the per revenue per country, uh, United States has 32% just between these, um, you know, these countries. And Australia has the next one. So, you know, it might be kind of hard to glance at this really quickly to know who has the highest, um, but what we can do is we can go right here and we can go to sort and we can do largest to smallest. And there we have the United States on top. Now, when you do it right here, it's not sorted largest uh, to smallest. You'd have to go in again, click sort and do largest to smallest. And so now we can see that California has the, has the um, you know, biggest percentage they're pulling in 20% of that 32% uh, of revenue. So I'm just gonna click Control Z a few times and get us back to where we just were. Um, and what I wanna do is I wanna show you a few different things uh, pretty quickly. So we wanna pull in this profit and this cost. Uh, and so I'm gonna pull in this cost next and then I'm gonna pull in this profit. Again, uh, I'm going to change the currency on this. And I'm not going to change the names um, right now, but you, know, you absolutely can do that. Now the revenue is the how much is actually being sold. So you know for the United States it was 27 million. 
Now the cost is how much did it cost to manufacture or, or store um, or distribute all of these products. So that was 60 million. And the profit is actually how much money is being made. At the end of the day, after um, you know all of their costs, after all their employee costs, after everything, they're still making, the United States is still making $11 million. Now you might look at this and you might say, well, you know, I can kind of glance at it and say, know that this profit is correct based off these two numbers. Um, but we can do a calculated field. Um, if you remember what uh, calculated fields are, that's something from Tableau, very uh, basically the exact same thing. And so we can create an additional column right here that is a calculated field that can add and subtract these things to make sure that our numbers are adding up correctly. So let's do that really quickly. Uh, let's go to pivot table analyze. We're going to go over to fields, items, and sets and go to calculated field. Now we can name this anything. Um, and I'm just going to, for demo purposes, I'm going to say, um, oops, calculated field demo. Uh, I'm sure yours will be different. Now, um, if you want to, you can go in here and this is the formula. It's almost like, um, you know, we haven't looked at formulas up. This is our first tutorial, but you know, when we look at formulas, it's basically the same thing as writing it if inside of a cell, but here it gives us kind of this um, open text to do how we uh, do what we want with it. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to do revenue. I'm going to insert that. Uh, I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to do revenue. And so that's the, the, the very large number. And then we're going to subtract and we're going to subtract our cost. I'm going to insert that. And let's do this and click OK. So this is our calculated field demo column that we just created. And as you can see, it matches our uh, sum of profit column exactly. And that's exactly what we want to see. We want to kind of check to make sure that this revenue and cost uh, fields are generating the correct profit. And sometimes those are off. And so it's really good to kind of check those and have that additional column. Um, you probably wouldn't have this if you were, um, you know, going to submit this to somebody. Uh, just so you know, now that this is an actual column, you can't go here and do something like cut or, or and paste it over here. You know, that's not, uh, I won't let you do that. What it is, is, is now an actual um, column. And so we can go and remove that. And we can add it back at any moment. So if we want to go back and add that, um, oops, add that down here, we can do that because we've created that column. It's now permanently there unless we go and delete all of that data. Uh, and so we can just click this check mark and it will get rid of it for us. All right. Now the last thing that we have not used down here is the filters. Now the filters is exactly what it sounds like. It's going to allow you to filter on certain things. Um, but probably not things that you already have included in your pivot table. So if you add something like the country down here, um, it's going to kind of expand everything. And then if you then go and filter on it, it kind of breaks it down. That's really not what the filter is kind of used for or meant for. Um, for example, right up here, we have a uh, customer gender. Okay. So let's take the customer gender and we'll put it in this filters. Now we can see all of the revenue, all of the cost, all the profit, and we can do that based off of the gender. So we can filter by a gender, not really having to change anything about our pivot table. And so at a super quick glance, we can see that uh, the males are, the, the profit from the males is 16.487 million, and the profit from the females is 15.733 million. So at a super uh, basic level at a really quick glance, we can see that the men or the males are, you know, spending a little bit more than the females by about, about $700,000. Now let's go ahead and create one more pivot table. Uh, we are going to create a pivot table right over here. Let's go back to the sales right here. Again, control shift right down. It's going to select all of our data and we're going to click OK. So one thing that we're going to look at is we're going to use some of this date uh, information right here. So let's select our country just like we did before. Um, and what we want to do is see, you know, what year were we performing our best? When were we doing our absolute best uh, with, oops, let me go back, uh, with our sales. So I'm going to select the year and put that in our columns. And so 
Now we have 2011 through 2016, and we want to look at our revenue. So let's put our revenue right down here. And now we have all of our revenue nots. Again, make this into a currency, just like that. And super quickly, now we can get a really quick glance at how Australia was doing each year. And we can see that there was a huge uptick in uh, 2013 and a huge uptick in 2015. That didn't happen for every single country. Uh, it did go up uh, for most countries, very slightly for some. But we can see on a large scale from um, year to year what that's like. And so within just a few minutes, we're able to create some really useful pivot tables that anybody could look at and understand. And that's really the biggest use of these pivot tables is that you can kind of group these things together, show some uh, information and data at, at kind of a broad, larger scale, and make it to where anybody who's looking at it can understand it. That is why pivot tables are so useful. And so I hope that this video was helpful. I hope that I was able to walk through it and help you better understand how pivot tables work and how you can use them when you are working within Excel. All right, so let's jump right into it. Right here, we have the Dunder Mifflin sales report. And over here, we have all the products that they were selling along with the months that they were sold in. And so in January, they sold 450 reams of paper. Down here, we have the total items per month. And so in January, they sold 898 units of uh, products or, or things that they sold. And at the very end, we have the year end total. So this is the total amount of paper that they sold throughout the year. Now we're gonna use this data right here for all of our charts. Now, you may not have data exactly like this. It can come in lots of different flavors, but you're gonna get the basic gist of how to use charts, how to edit it, how to customize it to fit what you need. And then we're gonna kind of put it right over here and kind of create its own sheet where we can kind of visualize all the things that we want to show. So let's jump right back over here into sales. And first thing we need to do is kind of highlight the data that we're gonna be working with. Now I'm gonna start with everything, but um, you know I'll show you along the way. We don't actually want everything, but we can filter that stuff out as we go. So let's go right here and we're gonna insert and we're gonna go over to charts. Now this is the chart section. There's lots of different types of charts, um, but the first thing that we're gonna be looking at is right here. This is a 2D column or kind of like a bar chart. And we're just gonna click right here and we're gonna pull this down. So now that we have this down here, there are a few things that I wanna show you before we actually really get into it. And I kinda of wanna show you the options that you have. So if you go up here, we have different uh, chart styles. And so if I hover over them, you can see that each one kind of looks a little bit different. And it really doesn't matter, uh, it doesn't, really change the data in any way, just how you visualize it. And so if that is important, if that is something that you um, you want to stick with a certain theme or a certain look, then go for that. Uh, the other thing that's really nice to have over here is this switch row and column. So right down here, you can see this purple and you can see this red. Those are our rows and columns, and we can switch that right here. So if we go like this, now, instead of the months being right here, the months are the colors and the actual product is right here. Let's click it again and it'll go back. And so now we have this kind of time series. Now we have January through the end of your total. Now, this one is one that I think is super helpful. You know, it, you can do it down here as well if you go to this filter. Um, but both of these are super helpful because you sometimes just want to select all the data and then kind of get in there and mess with it. Something that we want to get rid of is this total items per month. So we want to remove that. And then we also want to remove this year end total because both of those are, are kind of the end result. They're not the actual data per month or, or per product. So we're going to get rid of those and we're going to apply that. And as you can see, just right off the bat, our data has changed dramatically. Uh, and that's because we aren't including these, these large, large numbers that were kind of throwing off uh, the visualization for us. So this one right here, as is, is already pretty good. Um, what we can do right here is we can change this and we're just gonna say products sold per month. Now, what we can do if we want to move it to another, um, to another sheet is we can actually move the chart and we can select where we want to move it. We can move it to chart sheet and we can do that. 
or something that I do um, almost 99% of the time is I just copy and I come over here and I'm gonna paste it. And so now we have this, um, this chart right over here as well as back here. And so I typically tend to do that because now we can still go over here and change this one as much as we want. So if we wanna go in here, we can alter this one and it won't affect the other one. So we just have basically two copies. So we're gonna keep this one right here. This is gonna be our first visualization. Um, and as I said, it's, it's fairly straightforward. If you've ever done any types of charts or graphs before, um, right here it's January, February, March, April, May. And if you hover over these, you can see that that's the, the paper. And if we just glance, you know, the paper is their biggest product by far. And so that blue, um, which is their paper, is going to be the biggest every single month. So that makes perfect sense. Now, what if we want to change up uh, the, the kind? So what if we want to change up the kind of visualization that it offers us? Well, we have a lot of different options. Let's go right over here to change chart type. Now, this is going to offer you just about everything you could possibly imagine or want and even things that you absolutely would never ever want ever. Um, and so I'm going to show you some of the good ones and I'm going to show you some just absolutely insane ones that uh, Excel came up with, which cannot, I, I could not imagine a scenario with, that these are ever used. Um, but within these columns, you can do, they're called cluster columns, uh, these stacked columns. So it would look just like this. Those are often used as well. Um, and then we have ones that I, they're just not used often. Let's let's take a look at this one right here. I mean, it's tough. It's tough to look at, um, but let's let's put it right here. This is basically the same thing that we just had, except visualized in a different, um, we'll call it more unique way. Uh, and let, let's, for the sake of it, let's put it over here. Um, these two things show the same information. They show the same data, just one is shown well and one is not shown well. Um, I'm not a fan of these 3D type of visualizations. Uh, I just don't like them. But maybe you do and, and you want to use that. That's fantastic. Let's go back. Um, something else that you probably use a lot are things like these, um, these line graphs. Okay, so these are line graphs and they're different types. So they're these stacked, 100% um, stacked line, lines with markers different flavors for this this type of line graph and so you can go in here and take a look again um not my favorite but they have it as an option if you choose so choose to do this um but i kind of i'm kind of a simple guy um but i'm gonna go in here and it's pretty clustered um i want to kind of take the ones that have the highest sales uh, or the highest total amount sold so that would be paper, manila folders, and three ring binders. So let's go in here. We wanna keep paper, we wanna keep uh, manila folders, and we wanna keep three ring binders. And let's apply that. And so now it's a lot cleaner, and we're just going to copy this, and we're gonna put it over here. And I'm just putting these all over here for you uh, because we'll look at this at the end and just kind of see different options and, and ways to do things as we have gone through this tutorial. So let's go back here. Now, something else that we haven't looked at is the actual colors and color schemes that you can do. So let's go right here to these chart styles and we can go to color. Now, color is um, something that probably is quite overlooked um, in actual charts and graphs. Some terrible colors like this or, or this, um, where they're really close together, especially when you have a lot of them. Um, for example, let's just pretend we put all of them back really quickly. It is near impossible to distinguish these colors. Um, we wouldn't we wouldn't want that. Let's go back to this color. You know, when you have it like uh, in some of these colors, at least, it at least distinguishes them. So you can kind of see what you're working with. Uh, but when you have it in these monochromatic options, sometimes they're just impossible to distinguish. So be sure to choose the right colors that you're using so that if somebody who's never seen this data before looks at it, they can easily distinguish uh, the product and the month that you are looking at. But let's go just back up here. We'll choose this default option. Um, well, let's choose this one right here. This one's nice, although there's lots of yellows and oranges. Uh, let's see this one. 
this one's not bad. Greens, blues, uh, and like yellows. So that's nice. Um, other things that we want to look at, and there are these chart elements right here. Other things that we can add are things like data labels. Um, and right here, it's super messy. Um, but if we went back and we got rid of some of these things like the printer, staples, highlighters, pens, and total, if we apply that, it's a little bit easier to distinguish. Um, and that's you know something that you may be interested in doing. You can also add this data table at the bottom, which is the actual columns and rows that you have for this visualization right here. Now, let's expand this quite a bit. I'm gonna make this extremely large. If you have something like this, it actually can be pretty nice. Um, you know, maybe we get rid of these data labels, but it can be easy because you're putting it all in one place. You can also make this two separate visualizations. So you can have one visualization just like this and right underneath it, you can have the actual rows and columns, but this option allows you to put it all in one. So let's put this back down because that is way too big. And uh, wait, let's expand it a little bit. Now, if you notice right here, we have our legend up top. Um, it is possible to actually change that. You can go right here and you can move this um, kind of wherever you want, um, but it's not exactly easy to put based off how we have it right here. If we go in to this chart elements, we go down to legend and we hit this little arrow right here. We can select it on the right, the top, the left and the bottom or we can just go to more options, uh, which allows us to push it anywhere. But um, let's say I want to do it just like this. I'm going to put it on the right and I actually want to bring it down right here. And, you know, that's just an option if you want to kind of customize it a little further, makes it a little cleaner. Uh, you can do that with almost any of these things. So if you click on this, oops, if you click on this, you can move this anywhere as well. So if you want to move this over here on top of it, you can and make it look terrible or you can move it. Uh, right back over here, you know, this is something that you can move around. Uh, you just kind of want to make sure you're doing it the right way. So let's get this back where it was. There we go. Now, before we go any further, let's copy that and put it right over here with our other uh, charts and graphs. And if you see over here on this side, we have this format chart area. Notice I haven't showed you this at all yet. That is because I genuinely just don't use this almost at all. Um, there are some good stuff in here, um, and I'm sure that, you know, if you are someone who really wants to go in there and super customize it, you can do that. Um, but I honestly, I just never get in here and I never, you know, change the glow or the shadows. Um, just not something I use. And, and some of these are only for these three, 3D formatting, which I never use. And so I'm not going to show you and walk through these things. Again, I, I really don't use it. And so if you want to go in there and mess with it, uh, you know, by all means, go for it. It's just not something that I want to take the time to show you. And with that being said, let's go back over to this chart sheet that we have. And it was super, super easy to get these um, charts and graphs and, and, and whatnot. There are lots of different options. Again, if we go back here and we go up here to chart design and go to the change chart type. And again, there are a ton of different options like a pie chart um, like this. It's it's, you know, you can try to figure this out and use these. Um, but, you know, I wanted to show you the ones that you'll probably use the most, which are these columns and line charts. And they all kind of are similar in their own way. This bar chart is basically, you know, this column chart just on its side. And so they all have their different flavor. They all have their different way of visualizing the data. But in essence, they're using the data in a similar way to to visualize it and represent the data itself, especially things like these box and whisker plots or these waterfall charts. Uh, you know, these are things that usually require specific data to kind of use. Uh, and, and so I'm just using data that you'll probably see the most of um, like this, this sales data. So I hope that this has given you a pretty good, um, you know, quick understanding of how to use these, how to customize them how to copy and paste them over to a different sheet to create some type of little uh, chart and visualization sheet that you can use to show your employers and, and visualize the data that you are working with. All right, now before we start, I wanna say that this is not like every other tutorial that I have created. This one is very streamlined, okay? So I already know exactly what I'm gonna do. There's not gonna be much messing around. I've left little notes here and there. Um, and I'm going to try to get through it because there's a lot of them to get through. Um, so all these ones at the bottom. 
Now, these are ones that I use a lot that I think are useful. Again, if you know other ones that you use a lot, the things that I should be using, which I know there are ones that I left out of here, you know, put it in the comments. Um, I'll see the ones that people are liking and I will, I will create more videos on these because I know there are so many. I also will save this um, Excel in uh, on the GitHub so you can go and download it. It'll be exactly what you're looking at right now. I highly recommend trying these formulas out for yourself so you can get a feel for how they work and how they're actually used and you can mess around with it yourself. So um, as you can see at the bottom, we're going to start with uh, max min and then we're going to go on to some more, I think, a little bit more uh, difficult things. Um, and all these things are super useful. I'll try to talk about how you can actually use it as we go through it. Some are super self-explanatory, but some may not be. So this one I think is super self-explanatory, but again, one that you're going to use all the time. Um, and so uh, what we can do is we can say equal, and that's how you kind of start off saying this is going to be a formula. In this cell, equal means uh, I am now creating a formula. And we're going to say M-A-X. And I'll hit tab, and so it'll kind of populate it. And right here, if you've never seen a formula before, it'll kind of give you what the inputs need to be. So it's going to say max of number one, number two, et cetera, et cetera. What we're going to do is we're going to give a range. So we're going to go from here down to here. You don't have to close the parentheses, but you can. I'm going to. And then you hit enter. And so for this date, it's going to give us the max date. Now, these are um, the start dates for these people right here. And so if we just kind of glance through here, we can see that 2013 was the last year and this one is actually the latest in that year. And so it gave us the correct one. The min is gonna do the exact opposite. It's going to give us uh, the smallest. And so we'll give it the same range. We'll close the parentheses and it's gonna say uh, December 7th of 1995. And we can see that that is correct. So Michael Scott started in 1995, the earliest of all the employees um, and you can do the exact same thing for really any of these columns. Um, we can see who the who's making the most money, uh, or at least what the highest salary is. Uh, so we'll do um, max, and then we'll do the salary range. And so this is this one again. Uh, whoops, what did I do? Oh, I did the wrong range, didn't I? No, I didn't do the wrong range. It's just there it goes. Uh, this column was a date range or a, a date column for whatever reason. So let me get rid of that. Uh, and then we can do equals min and we'll do again, we'll do the salary. And at a quick glance, we can see that Pam Beasley is making the least and 65,000 is Michael Scott, who's making uh, that. So super simple. It shows the max. It shows the min. You can select a range. There you go. Let's move on to if and ifs. Now, if is, um, I think, pretty straightforward. So all you're going to do is you're going to say, if this, then that. Um, ifs is a little bit different. So ifs is you can you can put multiple conditions. And as we're writing it, I'll show you kind of what it's, it, the conditions that need to be met. All right, so we're going to click right here. We're going to say equal. We're going to do if, hit tab. And we need a logical test. Uh, and so we're going to give it a range or, or, or something. We're going to say if it's equal, greater to, um, something like that. And then we're going to say if the value is true, what's the, what is going to be the output? Or if the value is false, what's going to be the output? So let's do uh, this right here. We'll do this age range. And so if they are greater than, let's say, let's do 30. If they're greater than 30, we're going to do a comma. And so if the value is true, what, what should be the output? Uh, if they're greater than 30, we're going to call them old. And then if it is false, so if they're younger than 30, what should it say? And we're going to say young. And we'll close the parentheses. And there you go. So if they're over 30, then they are going to have young. Or if they're younger than 30, they're going to have young. Now. This is something where you would need to specify if you want 30 and over or over 30. We chose over 30. So 30 is not included in that. Um, so they're going to be young. Now, uh, let's get, we don't actually need two of these. That's pretty self-explanatory. The ifs is a little bit different, right? You can have multiple conditions. So let's open that up real quick. So ifs, and now we have a logical test a value if uh, that's true, then you can do logical test two value if that's true. Um, 
So you can have multiple, multiple, multiple things. Now, this one is a little bit different. In this one, oops, let me get out of this. In this one, you had a value of true, a value of false. Ifs does not have that. Ifs is going to give you um, different ranges and different specific conditions. And you can't say if this one's false, you're just gonna have multiple conditions. So let's do equals and ifs tab, and we'll do our first logical test. So let's do um, if the salesman, or if that equals to salesman, we're gonna say, we're gonna respond with sales. So that's if the value is true. That's what we want the output to be. Now we're gonna go on to our logical test too. So you're gonna see this pattern, right? If this is our uh, conditional or logical test, so if this is true, this is what's gonna be returned. So you'll notice that's just a, a pretty simple pattern. We can just do random things. So if it's equal to sales, um, and we'll just do the same one. If that is equal to, let's say HR, we can say fire immediately. And now we're gonna say, if it's equal to regional manager, I'm going to say give Christmas bonus. And we'll close the parentheses and let's see what we get. So as you can see, there's no default value for true or false. Like, like this one, there was a logical test and if it was true, there was a value. And if it was false, there was a value. So for every single one, you'll get a value. For this one, that's not exactly gonna happen. As you can see, there are these NAs. Now, when that happens, it just means nothing met that condition. So we never said anything about supplier relations. We never said anything about accountants. But if it was part of that ifs statement, then it got something. Um, and so that is how the ifs works. Now let's move on to length. Uh, this is exactly what we're going to do, but you know some of the uses for this, uh, for the length, I've used it for a lot of different things. Um, one thing that I've used it for in the past, and uh, you know, max and ifs, you know, you can use it for almost anything. Length is uh, there's a lot of different use cases. One I used to work with a lot of um, customer data or, or patient data. They had like social security numbers, and if you know there was bad social security numbers, we didn't want to include that. And so we do like the length of that. And if a social security number was, let's say, 10 numbers or 11 numbers, where it should only be nine or, or you know, however many they are, I think it's nine, then we know that that social security number is incorrect. And then we can get rid of that or discard it from our results. That's just an example, right? Um, so for this, oops, what did I do that? I did control Z to undo that if you didn't know how to do that. Uh, so we're going to do equals LEN, which is length. Um, and again, if you didn't see that, it returns the number of characters in a text string. So let's go right here and let's go to, uh, let's go to their last name and we'll give it a range. So it's going to tell us how many characters are in that string. So for Halpert, it's seven characters. For Flenderson, it's 10 characters. And we're able to see a length. And so again, there are a lot of different use cases for this. Uh, the social security number was one. Another one is phone numbers, right? If you look at the length of the phone numbers and there's uh, ones that are like 12 numbers long, you know, those might not be ones that are accurate and you need to go look at them and see if you want to include them in your results or your output. So that is how length is done. Let's move right over to the left and right. Um, I... I might be going a little fast, but uh, you know I'm keeping it. I'm keeping it live. I'm keeping us on our feet. Uh, so let's keep going. Left and right um, are kind of like substrings. If you've taken the the SQL um, tutorial series that I've done, uh, substrings are where you can choose a certain part of the text string and you can extract data from that. Um, and you usually have to reference a certain number, so a certain amount of characters. And that's the exact same thing, except. Uh, unfortunately, there's no substring. There's substitute, but there's no substring. Left and right is really the closest thing that we have. So let's kind of take a look real quick and see what we can do. So we're going to do left, and it's going to say return the specified number of characters from the start of a text string. So we're starting from the very far left, and we need to choose our text, 
and then choose the number of characters that we're going to be looking over. So let's go over here and let's just choose, you know, start simple. Uh, we'll get a little bit more advanced. So we have, uh, this is our text range. So these are the, the, the ones that we want to look at. And then how many characters do we want to look forward? Um, and we'll just choose three as an example. And so you can see that it takes the first three characters from every single um, thing. Now you can also do this with numbers. It doesn't just have to be, um, you know, name with, with uh, actual words or letters. You can do the exact same thing. So you can say, right. Um, and we're going to choose our, sh our string. Uh, and let's do this one. So, you know, all of them start with 100. Um, and we'll just say we want to take the last one. So this one is going to start from the very far right and go over one character. So right here, you can see this is our range and I just chose one. So starting from the very far right, we go over one character and that's what we take. And so that can definitely be useful. Another one that you can do, and this one is one that I have used so many times. I mean, honestly, countless times in, in actually using this in my job. Uh, so we're gonna go from the right and we're gonna look at a date. So, you know, sometimes you have these date structures, month, month, day, day, year, 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 or year, um, you know, day, month, year, all these different. And sometimes you just want to extract either the month or the year or, or something like that, the day. And so we want to come in here and we're just going to extract the, oops, I want to make that a range. We want to extract the year of the start dates. So we're going to do that. And then we're going to go over four because we want to take the first four characters from the right to give us the entire year. So let's do that. And now we can see exactly the year. And this can be just super, super useful. This is, again, one that I've used a lot. And so that is one that you might want to remember in case you're ever doing analysis on, you know, start and end dates or, or anything with um, date data. Uh, again, one that I highly recommend remembering. Let's go over to date to text. I actually probably should have included that um, before because I actually used it in this one. Um, if you notice right here, this is a text. So in, in this one we just did, that was a text. You can't do this right on um, start and end dates when it's a date uh, format. And let me show you. So this is a date. Now, if I do equals and, you know, we just did this, uh, let's do it on the end date. And I mean, I'll do the whole range. Give me a second. And we'll do four. It's giving us completely random numbers. Why is that? Because underneath the date range, there are um, numbers. Right. So if I go right here and I make this a general, it's going to have a numbers and look, these are the first four characters from the right. And so it's doing what it's supposed to do, but uh, it's not doing what we actually want. And that's the issue. So how can we convert this? Now, there are a ton of different ways, um, but the quickest, probably the easiest, besides actually writing, writing it out like this, like 11-2-2001, which then converts it to a date format. Um, but what you can do, you know, just so you know, is you can create it as a text. You can do 11-2-2001. And now it will stay a text string. And as you can tell, these are a little bit different because this one is uh, formatted or situated on the right and this one's on the left. That's how you can tell the difference. Now, if you don't want to do it by hand uh, completely manually and waste hours of your time, you can do it in a very simple way. So we're gonna do uh, text. So this is the exact um, formula that we're going to use. So let's get rid of that one. Oops, there we go. So we're gonna do equals, we're gonna do, uh, oops, text. It says converts a value to text in a specific number format. So for a date format, we can choose a date format and then it'll convert it to a text for us, which saves so much time, I promise you. Uh, let's do all of these just like we did. And then we need to tell it what the format is. If we don't, if we tell it something incorrect, it's gonna give us a completely terrible output or just give us an error altogether. So this is a day, day, month, month, year, 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 year format. And that is what we're gonna do. So we're gonna do DD slash MM slash YYYY and close that up. And there you go. And now we will, because it's in a formula, what we need to do is copy this and paste it right over here. And now you can see that is a general, this is something that we can use as a string. 
And let's just check it just to make sure. We're gonna do right, we're gonna do this one, let's do all of them. And we'll do four, and there you go. So now it works. That is what we are looking for. Um, and you can do that. Imagine doing that with millions of rows or, you know, let's say 10,000 rows. It's going to be a breeze, right? It's going to take you two minutes or a minute to do everything that you want to do instead of having to just do a bunch of mess to convert it to a string, which I promise you I've done. And it just takes forever. It's, it's terrible. So that is uh, date to text. Super helpful formula. Let's go over to trim. Now, I, I purposefully messed up this column. Now, why do I did I mess it up like this? Because when you're working with real data, you're going to get data like this. It, it, it's messy. It's dirty. It just has random spaces at the end for no reason. Um, because sometimes you're going to be working with um, data that is inputted by a user. It's not like a drop down option. So imagine somebody's typing this in. They accidentally put a space. So they actually put an enter or something, and then they submit it. And this is how it's going to look in the database. Um, and if you're a data engineer or, you know, you're working with the raw data, if they don't clean that up, then you're going to be working with that, that dirty data. And I, I guarantee you, if you're working as a data analyst, you're going to see stuff like this, not with maybe a last name, but all sorts of data. So we're going to go right here. We're going to say equals trim, do open parentheses. Actually, this says removes all spaces from a text string except for a single space between words. So like, you know, if it said Halpert space uh, or Jim space Halpert, it won't take the space in between there because it, it kind of understands that the, in normal language, a space is supposed to be there. So it won't do that, um, but we'll take that. We'll give it this range, close that up. And there you go. Now it is nice and clean, much more usable. Now let's look at concatenate, one that I have used just way, way, way too many times. Um, and something that I've used concatenate for, and you'll see this one in a lot of demonstrations for a good reason, is because a lot of people use it for this. Um, so what you can do is you can say equals, um, and well, let me tell you what concatenate does real quick. So what concatenate does, oops, I'm totally messing up here, um, but it joins two or more text strings into one string. It basically joins things together and, and adds them together. So let's do concatenate and we're gonna add this first and last name. Again, one that gets used all the time, but that's because um, it really is useful. So you can do this and you can say, now I wanna include this. So concatenating this and this, and let's take a look. So it says Jim Halpert, uh, but it's all connected. And that's typically not how people write their names. So what we can do is we can go back in here and we can do what my demonstration up here already tells us to do, which is we're just gonna add another thing in here. And if we add two parentheses, we can include anything in here. We can include a dash, we can include an exclamation point, or we can just include a space. So let's just include a space really quick. And just like that, it works perfectly. And so now we have the full name. Now, something that you could use it for is something like generating uh, an email. This is something that you absolutely could do. Um, and it's you know pretty simple. So I'm gonna do it like this. I'm gonna say, oops, what did I do? I'm gonna say um, dot. And then at the end, I'm gonna say at, oops, comma, quotation at gmail.com. And now I've created emails for all of these people. So just something that you can do with this um, and something that it, it absolutely is used for. And you'll see that demonstration almost everywhere because honestly, it gets used a lot um, by data analysts. And so, uh, you, you know, just a good one to know, understanding how that, that concatenation works. Um, let's go over to the next one. <clears throat> so we are going to do substitute. Now, substitute's really interesting. Um, there are different ways you can do it. I'm going to show it to you on these dates real quick. Uh, and that's what we're going to look at. So changing a date format, changing how uh, what it's supposed to look like is absolutely something that happens all the time. And, um, you know, sometimes you'll even get it like this, where it'll look like it'll be messy, it'll be different, a different, um, I guess, format. 
So this one has, all the other ones have um, slashes where these ones have dashes. And, you know, what you can do is if you want to, well, let me actually go with the no instances real quick because this one is uh, actually makes the most sense. Um, so we'll do equals and we're going to say substitute. And oops, and let me say substitute replaces existing text with new text in a text string. So if we do an open parentheses, it says we take the text, we have the old text, we have the new text, and then we have how, what instance or how many times uh, or, or, or what instance are we looking at? And I'll explain that in a little bit. So the text that we're going to be looking at is this one right here. So let's take this range. And the old is we're going to take this dash. And so let's take the dash. And then what do we want to replace it with? We want to replace it with this slash right here. I think it's a forward slash. Isn't that what it's called? So it's called a forward slash. Am I crazy? Um, and we're not going to put an instance. Notice that that's in a bracket. That means it's optional. We're going to do none of that. Um, and what it's going to do is it's going to fix this. So this one is now in the correct format that we want. Uh, and that's fantastic. That's, you know, that's what we tried to accomplish given what we had. Now let's fix that. If we want to do the exact same thing, uh, we can say, uh, what, what, what are we doing? Substitute. We can do substitute. We can do open parentheses. We'll give the range. And now let's say we want to change all of them to a different format. So instead of the um, forward slash, I'm going to keep calling it that if that's correct. We want to give it a dash. And so then we close that. And now all of them are in this new format. So it, it's able to substitute a specific value for a new value. And if you don't include an instance, then it'll do it to every single one in there. So let's go over here and we're going to actually use the the um, the, uh, the instance num and I'll show you what that does uh, and so really quick we'll do the exact same thing that we just did we'll do the forward slash and we want to replace it with this one again this dash but we only want to do it on the first instance of that forward slash and so as you can see all the ones that um, all the ones that were replaced are the very first instance, whereas the second instance, which is the second time it appears in the string, does not get touched. So if we take this and we put it right over here and we move it to two, it's kind of the opposite. So the first one wasn't touched, the second one was. So we're choosing which instance or which time it shows up in that string, and then it replaces it. If you do not choose an instance, it chooses all of them. So this can be super useful if you want to do like a bulk replace, um, but you only want to do it on a specific column um, and you just want to use a formula really quick, right? Um, and so you can use this in a lot of different ways. So that's how you're able to actually do it with the first instance, the second instance, and if you don't include an instance at all. Let's go over to the sum. Uh, this is one I think everyone knows how to use, but I'm going to show you two other ones. Um, as well. So let's go to the sum and we're just going to do equals the sum. And I hope you know what this is. Well, not hope. I, I, if you don't know what this is, it just adds up all the numbers in range. So we're going to add. Sum means add. So we're going to take this and it's going to give us the uh, what all these salaries are together. So super, super simple. Sum is one of probably the most basic formulas that you can do. Um, sum if is a little bit different you can add an if statement, which we learned right back here. You can add an if statement and then add it if it meets a certain criteria. All right, so we're gonna do equals sum if, and then you're gonna need to give a range and criteria, and you can include a sum range if you would like. So we're gonna do the salary again. We're gonna do a comma, and now here's our criteria. Let's do if they have greater than 50,000 for their salary. And close up parentheses. So now it's only going to add up if their salary is greater than 50,000. Now his is 50,000 exactly, so that won't count. But we have 63 and 65,000, which does equal 128,000. So it, it just gives a specific criteria or an if statement, then it does the addition. Uh, so super useful in that one. 
So that is how you do a sum if, and sum ifs is kind of the same thing as we did back here. There's the if and the ifs. So the ifs is going to be if it has it meets multiple conditions. So let's take a look at that one. So let's do um, equals some ifs. Now, uh, oops. <clears throat> now, the syntax for this one's going to be a little bit different. And you'll see that in just a second. Um, but this adds the cells specified by a given set of conditions uh, or criteria. So let's do an open, open parenthesis. We'll give the sum range. So let's do um, the same one as before. Then we have our criteria range. So what are we looking at? What's um, This is the area that's going to be added after all these if statements are done, right? <clears throat> so we have to initially set that. Now we're going to say, OK, what criteria are we basing this off of? So let's put a comma. And we're going to base it off of, let's do this one. We'll say um, if the uh, gender, so we'll do comma, if that's female, oops, if that's female. And then we'll give another one. We can say if they're female and let's say they are greater than, oops, greater than 30. And we'll close that up. And it's going to give us 88,000. So female, female. Uh, there's one, two right here. So it's going to be this one and this one, and that equals 88,000. So that's how that works. You're able to incorporate several different conditions into uh, the sum formula. So again, I know this one's super simple, but you, you can use it in a much more complex way if you use the sum if and the sum ifs. Um, almost the exact same thing for this count. Uh, I'm not going to go super in depth into this one. Um, I'll just kind of show you because count is um, count and sum are kind of on the same level of difficulty. They're both pretty beginner. This is just going to give you a count of how many cells um, are there. So let's give this range. Um, and so it's not going to add it. It's just going to give us a count. So if we do right here and scroll over them, like highlight them, this count down here, oops, this count down here is nine. And so it's going to give us that count. But we can do a count with conditions, exactly how we did it in the sum. So if we do count if, oops, I did not spell that right. If we do count if, we're going to give a range and a criteria, exact same as we did before. Uh, so let's do this. I mean, you can do this on basically any of these. It doesn't really, for this demonstration, it doesn't really matter. Um, but we'll say if their salary is greater than 45,000. So how many people, this is going to give us how many people have a salary over 45,000 and that's five. So before in the sum if, if we did that, um, we did 50,000, it adds everything together. The count is just going to count the amount of cells that meet that criteria. And again, count ifs, uh, we're going to have a criteria range and then we will specify what if statements we want to be uh, to occur in order to count those cells. So let's do we want you know we want to count. Let's, it can be any range or it can be any of these. We'll do the ID this time. And now we can say <clears throat> you know we want it to be this is our criteria one. Uh, we can say we want it to be greater than we want their ID to be greater than one thousand and five. And let's say we want them to be male. So they have an ID over a certain um, a certain range, and then they are a male. So there's only three people that meet that criteria. And so it'll be um, Michael, Stanley, and Kevin. Those are our three people. And so it gives us a count. Very useful to give quick numbers like this, something I, I genuinely use a lot. Um, and I know I've said that a lot during this tutorial, but that's because everything I'm showing you are things that I've used a lot. So I don't feel like, um, you know, I'm speaking out of turn here. Let's look at this one. This one is very, um, has some specific use cases. Um, notice that this is a text right now. Um, if you do it when it is uh, in a date format, it actually will not work. I mean, I can you can test it out yourself. You just got to trust me. It's not going to work. So what this does is it's going to give you the range from this day to this day. That's what it's going to do. So let's do, uh, oops, days. And it's gonna, we wanna choose our end date. So this is our end date. That's kind of backward from what you think. End date to start date, 
right? You think start date to end date. So you have to start with this one, and then we're going to choose the start date. And now it's going to tell us how many um, how many uh, days was it from here to here. And this one it's five thousand fifty six. So network days is extremely similar, except it takes out holidays and it takes out weekends. And you can see how many working days has this person, um, how many working days or network days has this person worked, not including you know weekends and holidays, have they actually worked since their start date and their end date. So let's do network days and we need our start date, our end date, and you can specify ho extra holidays if you'd like, but there are a already standard set holidays in there that it takes out. Um, so, you know, if you want to do that, you can. So we're going to do the start date. Again, this one's different. This one says start date, end date. And then we're going to give the end date. And if you notice, they are going to be different numbers, dramatically lower because it's taking out weekends and holidays. So this is how many days, uh, calendar days they've worked. And this is how many days they've actually been in the office and worked. And that is it. Um, again, there are so many formulas. I mean, literally hundreds of formulas that you can utilize and use and are out there for you to try out yourself. If there are specific ones that I did not cover in this video, please put it in the comments below so that I can, you know, show you how to do these things. I, I, I will say I've probably used a majority of the ones that you're going to put in the comments already. And if I haven't used it, I'll take a look at it and see if it's really useful and I'll show you that. So thank you guys so much for watching. I hope that this has been helpful. I, I feel like a lot of these things are not things that I learned before I started. Almost all of these are ones that I learned while I was on the job. And so I'm hoping that you can get ahead of the curve and you can learn these things before you actually start so that when you get in there, you're just like killing it with the formulas and people are like, whoa, this guy is like, this guy knows what he's doing in Excel. Give him all the Excel work and then you become like, you know, just the Excel guy um, and everyone, you know, loves you for it. So I didn't include this in the formulas video last week because uh, I knew this was going to be a large one and a lot of people are going to want to know how to do this, what the difference between VLOOKUP and XLOOKUP is. So it has its own dedicated video to it. So let's get started. It is a formula. So we're going to come in here in the cell. We're going to hit equal and then we're going to start typing XLOOKUP. Now I'm going to hit tab in just a second, but uh, let's read what this says. It says, searches a range or an array for a match and returns the corresponding item from a second range or array. By default, an exact match is used. So really useful to know. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Let's hit tab and it's gonna complete it. And it's gonna start giving us, or it's gonna tell us what our input values need to be. We're gonna have our lookup value. We're gonna have our lookup array, our return array, and then some optional things like if not found. So if your option isn't found, you know, what will be, um, you know, the, the uh, output that it gives us a match mode and a search mode. And I'm going to show you um, kind of how to use every single one of these things. As you can see at the very bottom, I've kind of already set up all of the instructional um, instructional content for this video. And so we'll kind of get through all these different scenarios. So let's just start really quickly with um, how to use it very simply with the lookup, lookup array, and return array. So we're going to come in here and we're going to give it our lookup value. Now, Toby Flenderson right over here in A3 is going to be our lookup value. So that's who we're going to be searching for. Now we're going to hit comma, and now we're going to be needing to look up uh, or to input our lookup array. Now an array is just a, you know, a range basically. So we're going to do, this is where it's going to be searching for um, that value. This is where it searches for a three. So here's Toby Flenderson. Here's Toby Flenderson. So it will find it in this array right here. Then we're going to hit comma. And now we need to give it the return array, what it's going to return on that row when it finds it. So we're going to return his email. Keep it really simple. So what it should do, and let's close parenthesis. What it should do is it should take Toby Flenderson. It's going to search in this column or in this array. And then it's going to return the email when it finds Toby Flenderson. So it's on Toby Flenderson is on row six. So it's going to find Toby Flenderson. It's going to come over here and it's going to return Toby Flenderson at DunderMifflinCorporate.com. That's what it should do. Let's see what it actually does. Let's hit enter and it returns it. Now, 
if we drag it down like this, it'll apply it to all of these names right here. And it works exactly how it's supposed to. Um, again, if you have never used VLOOKUP, you don't know how good you have it, okay? VLOOKUP um, was extremely useful, but just uh, a bit complicated. And I'll talk about that near the end of the video when we compare VLOOKUP to XLOOKUP. But just know that if you're using XLOOKUP for the first time and you're just getting into using Excel, you guys have it good, okay? So just know that. Um, now let's go over here to XLOOKUP multiple rows because you can return more than one output with, um, with XLOOKUP. So let's go right in here and we're gonna basically write the exact same thing um, as we did before. So let's write XLOOKUP we're going to do Toby Flenderson as our value. We're going to search here and we're going to do something a little bit different this time. We want to include our end date and the email. So what we're going to do is we're going to start here. We're going to go down all the way to the bottom of end date. And then we're also going to include the email. And when we do that, it will uh, in, in the output, give us a row or a column for end date and a column for email. So an output for both. So let's hit enter. And now we can see that we have the end date here and the email here. Now, one of the downsides or, or something that I'm not a huge, huge fan of is, well, first off, I love that you can do this. That's fantastic. Um, but it have to be right next to each other. So you, you're only going to get that output exactly how it is in the columns. So if I went and did this range, um, I would include all of that. Um, so, uh, you know, Let's just, for example, let's pull that down here. So let's take this and put it right here. If I did instead of zero or, or 02 to P10, if I included age to email this whole range and I hit enter, it's all going to be included. So, you know, that's one of the small downsides of, of that functionality of when you can use multiple rows is that it's going to use the rows exactly as they are. You can't really customize it within the formula. You can move around um, these columns to how you want it. Um, so that is something to note. And again, you can pull this down and it'll be applied to all of those names. Let's go over to XLOOKUP exact match. So let's open this up. We're going to do equals XLOOKUP as we've been doing. And we're actually going to be looking at the if not found and the match mode, uh, both, you know, on this tab right here. So let's do what we've been doing before. We take our value that we're looking up. We take the um, array that we're looking and we're going to do the email. And, you know, as you can see, this says Toby Flender and not Toby Flenderson. So what we are going to do is we're going to hit comma. And if it's not found, you can return um, a value or a string that you want to return. Now, for simple purposes or for simple instructional purposes, we're going to do not found. And then we're going to close that off. So let's do this. And Toby Flenderson was not found. And so it was returned not found. If Toby Flender was actually in this full name, then it would have returned the email. And then if along the way, you know, one of these was not part of it, then, you know, we would have, uh, we would have had the not found. All right, so let's go right up here. We're actually just gonna copy this uh, because I want to reuse it. Um, and then we're gonna go right here and we're gonna hit a, a comma. Now this is our match mode option. And so we have four different options that we can choose from. A zero is an exact match and that is uh, by default, that is what we have or what we use. Then there's a minus one, and that's an exact match or next smaller item. Then there's a one, which is an exact match or next larger item. And then there's a two, which is a wildcard character match. Now we're going to do that and we are going to, um, you know, try this out and it's not going to work. And not just because I forgot to put a four. Um, it's doing it because it's searching for Beasley, but if there's not a wildcard option already put in here. Um, it doesn't recognize it. So we need to indicate where that wildcard needs to be. So we're going to do a double apostrophe or quotation marks. We're going to put an asterisk right here and then do another one. And we're going to hit uh, an ampersand. So we're going to have an ampersand right here. And what that's going to say is anything that comes before A4, anything that comes before Beasley is okay. doesn't matter what it is as long as it has Beasley at the end. 
that is going to be okay. So we're going to have Pam that comes before Beasley and that's going to tell it and it's going to say, okay, I know that anything that comes before Beasley is all right. And so when we hit enter is now going to return the output that we are looking for. And we can include that on these as well. Now, this one is Meredith. Um, and so Meredith is at the beginning. So we have Meredith Palmer. So we can actually take this and we're going to put this at the end of the ampersand right here. And now it'll work. And the exact same thing for Kevin Malo right here, Kevin Malone. So it just didn't include uh, the NE at the end. And so it's still going to work if we include that asterisk at the end. Now, I know I said we were looking at search order, but I'm actually going to kind of give you an exact match uh, first and then search order, but it's just kind of easier to show it over here. So I'm going to do X lookup. I'm going to look up this value, do a comma. Here's the range. This is our start date that's going to be looking for. And I want to return the full name. Now, no value in here has 11,000. But what we can do is we can do comma and then a comma for the match mode and do an exact match or next larger. And I know this is in the exact match part, but it you know, kind of refers to search order in a little bit um, where it searches for the next largest value. That's what, we, that's what that number one represents, the next larger value. So we have one, one, 2, 000, And if we look right here, the next value above one, one, 2, 000 is one, five, 2, 000. And so it should return Angela Martin. Let's see if that works. And there it is. Now let's look up the actual search order. Um, so let's do equals X lookup. This is the value that we want to be searching for. And we're going to be looking in this start date and comma. And we want to return the name. Now let's get over to search mode. Now the search mode performs a search starting at the first item. So at the very top, going down. So by default, it searches from first to last, but you can reverse that and do search from last to first, or you can do a binary search, which is where it sorts in ascending order or sorts in descending order. Um, and that's with the actual value. And so we won't be able to show this binary search or um, ascending or descending because our values are the same. But if we had different values and we were looking up um, using this um, next largest, we would be able to show that. But I'm going to show you this search from first to last and last to first. So let's put in by default, and this is what it would be, search from first to last, what the default would be. So it starts at the very top, it goes down and finds the first 5, 6, 2001, and returns Toby Flunderson. Now if we go in here and we hit minus 1, that is going to search from last to first. So it's going to start at the bottom and go to the top, and the first one that it finds is Michael Scott. So that's that first one starting from the bottom and then the Michael Scott right there. So these two, the exact match and the search order can kind of be combined into um, this one right here. We're using this one, um, which is, uh, you know, exact match or next larger. And you can include that in this binary search in this one as well. All right, now let's head over to the XLOOKUP horizontal. I think we're, we only have a few left. Yep, XLOOKUP horizontal, then we'll do XLOOKUP with sum, and then I'm gonna show you the VLOOKUP at the end. So let's go right here. Let's say equals XLOOKUP. The value that we wanna be searching for is February. That's what we're looking for. We hit comma. And where do we wanna to search to find February? We wanna search in uh, these calendar months. And then we hit another comma, and now we're gonna be searching for paper. So let's do paper and we'll hit enter and it found February and it returned paper right here. And we can do that for paper, printer and manila folders. And so it's gonna give us the 310, the 40 and the 118 from February. Now let's go right over here to X lookup with some. Um, I actually, it's basically a carbon copy of this. Uh, let's take this over here real quick and place it right there because it's the exact same thing, except at the end, we're going to use, uh, I'm going to show you how to use sum with the X lookup at the same time. Now, um, we are going to be using the formula sum and so we're going to do sum. And then within the sum, our first number is going to be an X lookup. And then our next value is also going to be an X lookup. So let's do X lookup. And now we're gonna search for our very first value. Oops, 
our very first lookup value. So we're going to go to I1, and then we're going to search this again. And we want whatever value oops, goes into that. So let's close that parentheses. And now we're going to do a colon and another X lookup. And now let's do March. So now we're going to search for March. We're going to do our search range where we're searching for that March. And we want the paper as well. And let's close that. And then we also need to close that parentheses. So now we are basically adding this February and this March. So it's going to be 310 plus 150. It's adding those um, two values and it should be uh, what? 460. So let's see if that is our output. And it is. So you can do this with a lot of things, not just some, but you're able to use XLOOKUP within different formulas. If you're searching for a specific value and a specific value um, in, in another um, cell, you can add those together using XLOOKUP, which is uh, honestly, it's pretty great. So let's go over to VLOOKUP. So I wanted to show you this because I wanted to show you where it came from and what we used to do, um, unless you are continuing to use VLOOKUP and what we can do now. So XLOOKUP, I just showed you kind of everything. Um, but super quickly, I'm going to show you how VLOOKUP used to work um, in a super short way so that you can understand how it used to be used and how it is used, uh, how XLOOKUP is used now. So let's go in here and we're going to say equals and we're going to do a VLOOKUP. And so we have a lookup value. And so we're going to click this. We're going to hit comma, just like we did before. And now we're going to do a table array. And the table array is a little different in that you're searching an entire area. So let's do uh, H2 all the way through O, oops, O10. So that's what, we're, that's what our table array is going to be. Then we're going to do a comma. And now we have to do a column index number. Which number um, are we going to be um, searching for? Or which um, value are we going to be searching for in here? And so we want to search for eight because this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We want to return that email and we're searching for the name right here in this very first column. So we have that comma and we're going to do eight. And then in the range lookup, you can do true, which is an approximate match or false, which is an exact match. And we'll do false. I don't know why it's not auto, auto doing it, but there we go. And now we will do it and it's going to return it just as we had it. Um, a lot of people, uh, I guess not everybody, but some people didn't like, and the reason why they created X lookup, you had to do those ranges. And if you ever went in here and then we, let's say we um, added another column, which happens to data. Now it gives us completely different, um, different data. So let's say for whatever reason we added uh, address. So now we have these people address. Well, now it's going to give us a different um, value. It's going to have this end dates because if we go in here, now it doesn't. Um, now the eighth is this end date and the ninth is this email. So if you have a VLOOKUP that you use for, um, you know, a calculation or a table that you've created or different things in Excel, you then have to go through here and manually change this. And so a lot of people didn't like that because if you, you know, needed to change data or you needed to change something or add an additional column, you'd have to go back and fix all of your VLOOKUPs. They wouldn't just automatically uh, move with it, which is what happens with XLOOKUP. And just to prove this, uh, let's go back to the very first one, which is the XLOOKUP. And right now the email is looking at 02 and through 010. Um, we're just going to insert right here. And that would be our new column. We'll do address, oops, address. And notice that it hasn't changed. And why is that? Because it auto changed for us from P2 to P10, understanding that it wanted to stick with when something was inserted here, it wanted to stick with the original data or the original array that was selected. And so XLOOKUP does that work for you and it makes it a little bit easier to automate things and create these processes in Excel without having to go fix it later, which you had to do with VLOOKUP. All so right, so let's jump right into it. I have this US president's data set. I got the base data set from Kaggle, uh, but I added some of my own data and then I messed some stuff up as well, just to kind of um, demonstrate some of these things that we're gonna be looking at today. 
this is not a full project. So, you know, we're not actually going to be using this to create any visualizations or anything like that. So, you know, all this is just for demonstration purposes. But we will be doing a full project in about two or three videos uh, in this Excel series where we're going to be doing from start to finish with a real data set. So, you know, if that's something that you're you're wanting, then we will absolutely be doing that. Now, something that you may be wondering is how do you actually identify what you need to clean in the data? What do you know to look for? Well, some of the obvious things are things like formatting and standardization. So things like, you know, this James Monroe is in all caps. That happens all the time within real data. Um, and, and so, you know, you want to standardize that or this all lowercase. You want to standardize that. You want that all to be the same. There's also things like um, right here where we have this wig and this wig with a bunch of random stuff after it. This happens all the time where it's not completely standardized. Um, and you may even notice, um, you know, there are some spelling errors in here and I'll, we'll kind of look through that in a little bit. And then, you know, there are things like additional spaces where there shouldn't be spaces. There are things like currencies that you need to be aware of. If you were importing this into, or we're going to be importing this into a SQL database, um, things like currencies can be just a problem or be really um, unnecessary. It may actually cause more issues in the long run. So you may just want to, you know, take that to the base uh, value. And then dates are always an issue. Always, always, always. Um, so always look at your dates, make sure they're, they're formatted correctly, make sure they're all the same. These are the types of things that right when I glance at this data set, these are things that I'm looking for. Um, one other thing that is actually the first thing that we're going to start out with is you want to make sure that your data is not duplicated. Because if your data has duplicate data in it and you don't want that, it's not supposed to be there. There are some specific use cases where duplicated data is okay. Um, you know, you, you want to get rid of that. And it's very easy to do in Excel. Uh, the first thing we're going to do, we're going to go uh, to this data tab. We're going to go right over here and we're going to get see if there's any uh, duplicates in our data. So we're just going to go up to remove duplicates it's going to automatically choose all of your columns to, to check against. So it's going to, for from A all the way through I, it's going to see is the exact same data in all these rows. And if it is, it's going to get rid of it. Um, and so we're going to click OK. And it did find one duplicate. And I'll show you that one real quick um, because, you know, it was right here. So Barack Obama was here twice. And then I'm going to hit Control. I hit Control Z to go back. I'm going to hit Control Y to go forward. And it removed that uh, that row completely. Now, in this example, you may be able to spot that with your eye, but in a real data set where you have 10,000, 100,000 rows, there's absolutely no way you're going to see that uh, or very, very unlikely that you are going to see that there's duplicated data in there. So just running a, a quick um, dedupe or, or removing of duplicates, that is really important to make sure that you um, have gotten rid of those things. So that's one of the first things that I do. Um, we're going to go into a lot of these different uh, columns and I'm going to kind of show you different techniques or things that I do when I look at actual data. So I'm going to come right over here. I'm going to insert. And this is what I actually do. I, I usually create a separate column, especially when I'm working with this, because I don't want to change this one. Um, I don't want to go in here and, you know, say um, equals upper equals proper, etc. There's a lot of different ways that you can change um, names or not a lot, but the main ones that you can change names and all of them are completely okay. So for example, I'm going to hit equal upper, oops, upper, and I'm going to go like this and close my parentheses. So I selected the cell, I close my parentheses, I hit enter. It is complete. And I'm going to hit um, in the bottom right, I'm going to hit double click this. It's going to apply it to all of them. It is completely okay to have your data like this. If you want it to be like that, um, if you want it to be all lower, you can do that. If you want it to be in proper case, you can do that. Um, there are, oops, there are different um, uses for all of them. And honestly, as long as it's all the same, typically it's okay. But if, um, you know, for example, if you're selling this to like a third party company or something like that, they may have um, what they want for their ingestion process when they take your file in. If you send, you know, a weekly file or a monthly file, they may want it exactly how they want it. And you can change that to, to what they want. Um, but as long as it's standardized for you, it's all the same for you, that is a good thing. So now we have all of these um, in the proper case. That's typically what I, I do, or I use upper. Those are the ones I use the most. I don't usually use um, lower. And if you go in here and you type in lower, 
you know, it changes it to all lower. I don't typically do that. Um, and I'm going to add, I'm going to, oops, I'm going to say president dash fixed. And so now all of these names, um, all of these uh, different uppercase and lowercase, these are all fixed. And it, and it just makes it so much easier to read and you don't have different um, uppercase and lowercase issues, all the same. So I'm gonna keep that right there. Uh, if we move a little bit to the right, if you look at this prior, now this prior is a mess. It, it has stuff all over. And to be honest, this is not really something that I would probably be using um, like in a real data set. I, I would look at this column and I'd say this is pretty useless. Um, I, if I had a very specific use case for this, this data in this column, I might try to you know, parse it out and do something, but I don't. Uh, this, this is a completely useless column to me. So I'm actually going to skip this one. I'm going to go to this party one. And this party one to me, it looks pretty important because this is something that I know I can group by. Um, and I can create visualizations with and and kind of break that out. And if you look right here, we're gonna add um, we're gonna add a filter. So now let's open up party and take a look. So uh, if we look right here, we have Democratic, Democratic dash Republican, Federalist, nonpartisan, Republican, Republicans, Whig, and Whig with a, a, a date and some information in the back of it, and then some blanks. Um, and it's really important when we're when we're looking at these um, ones that we think we might group by that we have these um, properly grouped. So Republican and Republicans to me right off the bat looks like a spelling error. And so I'm just going to deselect all. I'm going to go to Republican, Republicans, and it's literally Republican all the way down except for this last one. And to me, that's just something that I would update. So I would just go right here. I do that. If I didn't do that, and then I try to create, let's say, a pivot table on here, I'll have its own group of Republicans, and it wouldn't be added to Republican. And maybe that's on purpose, but let's just presume that we know this data extremely well, and that's not supposed to be like that, right? Again, that's, that just comes back to knowing your data really well, understanding what it, um, you know, what it should look like. And we know that it should not be like that. So we're going to fix that. Uh, the next thing that we're going to fix, um, and as you can see, it, it got rid of it. Next thing we're going to fix is this wig. Um, it, that's just like a, an error. That's that's some issue on the, the data side. <clears throat> and we're just going to fix that by updating it. Um, and that's it. I would always be keeping um, a, a copy of this with the raw data uh, somewhere else because this is presumably like a working document this is not a um, you know you, you aren't saving over your original file let's just say that and then let's take a look at these blanks real quick um, okay so there are these rows right here that have nothing I, I think we're okay but if we see anything different 47 48 okay so yeah it's just these ones right here that have no data in it anyways it's just seeing it in the filter so not an issue at all. So, okay, we're looking good. We've gone all the way over. We, we fixed this president. We skipped this one. Um, we, we cleaned up this party. And I kept this one in here because I'm not exactly sure if that's a Democratic or Republican. So I'm going to keep it its own thing. Um, I'm not a huge uh, history buff in that aspect. The next one right here is, um, the next one right here is really easy. Uh, this is something that happens all the time. Especially on actually, uh, most often it happens on numerical data. So like, uh, you know, there'll be a number of 1001. And then there'll be a space after it for absolutely no reason. Uh, and it happens all the time. It does happen like this as well, uh, where you'll see this. And all you got to do is do trim and select the, uh, the cell. I'm going to close that parenthesis. And we're going to apply that all the way down. What is so fantastic about the trim is that it's really intuitive and it knows basically everything it needs to do. For example, um, it gets rid of the uh, spaces before, it gets rid of extra spaces in the middle, and um, it'll get rid of extra spaces at the end, um, which you wouldn't be able to see, but they are there and they, they absolutely can cause issues. If you have spaces at the end that you cannot see, um, let's take this one for example, like if I had spaces at the end, that can cause issues when you insert or, or, or put that into a database. Um, that happens a lot with numbers. Um, you know, when you're putting that into SQL, 
that can cause issues. And so you really, it, it is important to actually do that trim. Um, and you can do that on all of your columns or just ones that you know you're having issues with. But once you import that data into SQL, you will know if there's an issue or not um, when you actually try to start using it. So we're gonna say vice and we're gonna say fixed. Oops, there we go. Uh, this next one is one that you'll run into a lot. When you're working with numerical data, you will encounter so many different issues. Um, one that I run into a lot is I, I've worked with a lot of cost data or pricing data. And when it's in an Excel, it, ha it sometimes comes in with um, these currencies, so like a dollar sign, a pound sign, things like that. And when you put that into SQL, it just is a nuisance, right? You're not going to be able to run... Um, it's going to go in as a text or it's going to be like a string, right? Because it has that special character and you don't want that. You don't want to have to then go in and then change things around. You just want to be able to start, um, you know, doing calculations on those numbers. So what you can do is sometimes it'll come in as a text. Sometimes it'll come in as um, a currency, which I think this one's a currency. We are just going to change that to be a number. And then we're going to get rid of these. Oops and get rid of those. That, it doesn't look as pretty, but that is much more useful than actually having the currency on there um, with the decimals. This actually is so much easier when you when you wanna use it for almost anything because you're able to add and uh, do things properly in other systems. In Excel, I think it does understand it, um, but you know that can cause issues. So there is how you do that. The next thing that we're gonna look at is these dates. and just notoriously, whenever I see a date field, I know there's going to be an issue with it. It's very rare that I get a date field that is perfect. Uh, it just, it, it is, genuinely is, um, is a novelty when that happens. And most of the time it has to do with, um, let's say a date comes into Excel and it's in a text format or a date comes into Excel and they're not the same. In this example, they are not the same. Um, and we just want them to all be similar. They say date. Uh, if you look right here, it says date. It says date. It looks like it should be the same. Um, but if we go like this, it all looks the same, right? There's no issues at all. If we were to um, try to use that, it may or may not be an issue. But we don't want to leave that to chance later on if you're using this with Python or something like that. It can cause issues. Uh, maybe not in SQL because it may um, see the underlying, um, what's in the underlying cell, not just what we see. But some systems won't. And so you want to make sure that they're all the same. And so, you know, what we were doing back here with, um, oops, with a party, and we were looking at this, uh, this filter and identifying the issues. I usually do that on date fields as well. And, and oftentimes, um, I, you know, just for, just for demonstration purposes, oftentimes I will get something like that. And then I'll come up here and I'll notice that there's this one random number. That happens all the time, all the time. Um, and so, you know, you want to make sure that you um, that you look at these things and just, just do at least a quick glance, if not kind of doing a kind of a deep dive into it. But all we're going to do is we're going to do both of these and we're going to do a short date. And let's take a look and see if that fixed it. And so now they are all the same format. And that is fantastic. That is exactly what we want. Uh, we're going to go back through here. We're going to get rid of these. Um, again, this is a working. Um, this is a working document. Oops. Uh, we need to. We're going. I'm going to do um, Control Shift Down. Oops. Let me go back up. Do Control Shift Down and copy. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm actually going to. Copy, and I, let me do it right here, I'll show you. Sometimes I do this, Doesn't just depends. I'm gonna go right here, I'm gonna hit right click, and I'm gonna paste as a value, which means it's not gonna take the um, calculation or the formula that I just did, uh, it's gonna actually paste it as that value. So we just replaced it. Um, right here you can see up here it says equals trim of G2. This now, now that I copied and pasted it over as a value, um, it got rid of that um, calculation, and now it is actually a string. So we don't need this anymore. And I'll do the same thing over here as well. I'm going to Control-Shift-Down, copy. 
and I just hit the right key uh, or the left key, sorry. Now I'm gonna right click and I'm gonna do paste as a value. And again, it has this proper and now it doesn't have the proper, it's actually the value that was here. So that's really important to note. Uh, and we're gonna get rid of that one. And so now what we have is, is already looking much better. Now, one of the last things I wanna look at is deleting columns that we are not gonna use. And this is why it's so important to keep a backup or, or the raw data not in this file. Because if you start saving over this file and this is your raw file, uh, that can mess up a lot of things. And that happens to me before and it's terrible. And then you have to request another file or you have to go back and find it or something like that, it's terrible. Um, so, so this is our working document. So we can mess with this and do whatever we want for our purposes. Now, for us, um, I can already tell you that this prior is a bunch of nonsense and we do not need it. We're not gonna use it for anything. And, it, and if we have, um, this is a small, very small data set. This only has like, um, let's say, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we have like eight columns that we're, you know, kind of using that has data, eight or nine. Now, that's a small data set. I've had ones with literally like hundreds. Um, and, and it has so many columns, uh, so much data. And sometimes it's good to just trim it back to the things you know you're going to use. This to me is absolutely useless. Um, we're going to delete that. And then right over here, it's pretty redundant. Um, it's just one number off. But if we scroll down just a little bit, um, it goes, it's basically just counts. It's a, I, you could even call it a unique um, identifier if you want. Sure, why not? But we don't need both. Um, so we're going to get rid of this first one. And now we have more of the useful and relevant data rather than the stuff that we absolutely know that we are not gonna use. Um, these date updateds and date createds, we may never use them, but we might. Um, so it's, it doesn't hurt to keep it on hand. Those other ones are ones that we are almost certain we will never use. Again, keep a backup. Just in case you need it, you can always go back and get it. So, you know, if you go back to what we started with and you look at what we have now, it is much cleaner, it's much more usable and these are small, subtle changes, um, especially with this very small data set of only like 50 rows or, or 46 rows. But you're going to be working with data sets that are thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of rows. And you need to know how to kind of look at this data, standardize it, um, format it properly for what you're going to be using it for. If you're keeping it in Excel, there are different things that you may do than if you're putting it into a database or going to be um, using it, in, you know, um, using Python to, to access it. So you need to kind of know your use case, but these are some things that I do all the time to kind of clean up the data before I use it for something, whether I'm creating pivot tables or I'm inserting it into, or, or I'm putting it into SQL. These are things I do all the time. And so hopefully that helps give you kind of an idea of some of the things that you should be looking for when you're actually cleaning data. And it's really important to understand why you're actually making these changes and the reason you're making these changes because some of the things that I did today may not be things you wanna do on a different data set that has different uses and different um, purposes for. So, you know, take everything that I've said and, and apply it um, with a little grain of salt to your data set because your specific needs may be different than what I wanted when I was cleaning my data set. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Excel tutorial series. Today, we're going to create an entire project in Excel. Now, if you've never done a complete project in Excel where you take the data, you clean it, and then you create an actual dashboard where people can click on things and filter things, this is going to be a really great learning opportunity, as well as potentially, you know, a simple project that you can use for your portfolio where you can spice things up and go a little farther than what we're going to be doing in today's video. I will walk you through every single step of the way, and hopefully we learn something together. And without further ado, let's jump right into it. Let's jump onto my screen and get started with the project. All right. So this is the data set that we're going to be working with. I will leave a link in the description to my GitHub where you can go and download it. So you can be working with the exact same data set that I am using now. Before we actually get into this data and start looking at it, I'm going to show you what the final dashboard is going to look like. Um, we're going to create a few different types of visualizations, nothing too crazy. Um, and then we'll create some filters as well. So we can kind of, you know, create some interactive filters with our data. So let's go right on over to our data set. Now I'm going to hide this because we are not going to use that. But what I am going to do before we do anything is I'm going to create a dashboard and I'm gonna create a pivot table, oops. And I'm going to create a working sheet. 
So um, all these things have different uses and I'll explain that as we go along. So this is our data set. Um, I'm going to copy this over to our working sheet. When I go into, you know, an Excel and I'm working on something, I don't like to, you know, use just the one that I was using in case I mess something up and it saves over it or some issue. I like to create a working sheet and keep the raw data right over here. It just makes my life easier. I don't have to save it and then, you know, open up a different Excel to compare them. So we have our bike buyers. This is our working sheets. This is our raw data. This is the one we're actually going to be working on today. So let's, um, let's start looking at it really quick and just kind of glance and see what data we're working with. And then we'll start cleaning it up, making it more useful for what we are going to be using it for. And then we'll start building out the dashboard. So right here we have an ID. Um, that should be a unique ID to each person. Uh, this is their marital status. So married or single. This is their gender, male, female. We have their income, children, their education, their occupation. Do they own a home? How many cars they own? How long their commute is? The region where they live? Their age? And if they purchased a bike? And this column right here is extremely important. This is going to tell us whether they did or did not buy a bike. So we got their information. They're looking for a bike, but they either decided not to buy a bike or they did buy a bike. And we're going to be using that one a lot in, the, in this video. And so, um, you know, this is basically the data set that we're working with, um, some of the demographics and, and information behind the person. So what we want to do when we are cleaning the data before we do anything, uh, I like to see if there are any duplicates in here. Um, what we're going to do is come right up here. Uh, we can go to, uh, ba -ba -bum. where is it? Right here. We got remove duplicates. So we're going to click on that. It selects every single one. Uh, we just want to see if there's any useless duplicated data that we do not need. Uh, and the data is a header, so we're going to click OK. All right, so we had a ton of duplicates in there uh, for whatever reason. So yeah, we do have duplicates in there, so I'm glad we did that. Otherwise, we'd have, uh, you know, not good data. We don't want that. Let's start right over here. Um, the ID, of course, we're not going to change. The marital status and gender are M's, S's, F's, and M's. Um, this isn't inherently a bad thing to have it like this, but you know we have to think about it from the perspective of someone who's going to be using this dashboard. Do they know what M and S is? Do they know what M uh, and F is? And if they don't, it's better to just spell it out for the most part. Um, so let's just do that. So we're going to click on the column B. We're going to hit Control H. That's going to bring up our Find and Replace. Now there's an M in both of these columns and there's different things. One is married and one means male. So what we're going to do is we're going to search by columns um, and we'll have match case. I don't think that's going to change anything, but that just means an exact match. Uh, and we're going to do M equals and we're going to replace it with married and we'll replace all. Awesome. And then we we'll do S is single. This one is super easy. We're going to do the exact same thing right here. So column C, we're going to hit control H. We'll do, still has by column, so we'll do M is male. We'll replace all of those. And F is female. And replace all of those. That's great. Uh, you know, the next column right here is income. And in a, in a previous video, I talked about how I don't typically like it in this format. And that's true. Um, if you're doing calculations on it or, or any other thing, it can mess it up sometimes having the dollar sign or it being a currency. We're not really going to mess with it too much right now. Um, what we can do is just kind of we'll make sure all of its currency. Um, we'll just go like that to make it a little simpler, but we're not going to change it to like a numeric. Um, we will use this in the visualization. We'll see how it looks. And if we need to, we'll come back and change it. If not, we'll keep it how it is. Um, so that's all we're going to do to that one. Uh, the children, those look good. We have education, uh, partial college, partial high school. This looks fine to me. Um, if there's any spelling errors or anything like that, of course, we need to clean that up. It doesn't look like there is. Occupation, skilled manual, manual. Uh, okay, those should be separate. Are they a homeowner? Should just be yes or no. All right. We have cars. One, two, three, four. Good night. Who owns four cars? Um, and then the, we have the commute distance. Uh, and you know, there's nothing 
terrible about this. It's giving you ranges, um, which can be a good thing. I say let's keep it for now, but I have a feeling when we get further and we start using it in the visualization, we may want to change this. So let's just hold off for now, um, but if needed, we will come back to this and we'll change this. Um, and then we have our region and that looks totally fine. And we have our age. Now, when you're using ages, typically you have some type of like age bracket or, or age range. And you do that because there are so many ages in here, right? It's 25 all the way down to 89. And if you're using that in some type of visualization, it could just get really messy. And so you'll create kind of, you know, just brackets around these so that you can kind of condense it and make it a little bit easier to understand. So let's do that and just create a new column. And then we can use that for our dashboard. So let's go right up here. We're just going to create a new column. Uh, we'll call this age brackets. And what we can do is we can use an if statement to kind of say if it's older than or less than and, and, and kind of give them these ranges. Um, that's one way to do it. And that's the way we're going to do it right now. So let's go up here. And what we want to do is we want to say is going to we're going to say equals and we're going to do if and we're going to close that parentheses. Now, what we're going to say is if this and we'll go right back up here, if this is less than so we're going to do this 31 and we're going to say comma. So if they are less than 31, what do we want to call them? What do we want their their, you know, name to be? We'll call them adolescent. Oops, that's not how you spell adolescent. Adolescent. Um, and then if they're not, what we're going to do is we're going to say it's invalid. Okay, and let's just see if this one works first. All right, it's not working at all. Um, okay, so basically what we did was um, incorrect. <laughs> we did it backward. Uh, we want to do, I said uh, L2 is greater than 31. No, we want to do like this. So let's do that now. All right. And it should pull up where if they're under the age of 31. So if they're 30 or below is basically what it's saying. So if they're 31, they'll be invalid. But if they're 30 or below, it's adolescent. So it is working properly. Um, and let's see what it let's see what it says. Perfect. So this one is working. And, and now what we want to do is we actually want to build on this and make it uh, kind of like a nested if statement, if you've ever um, heard of that or done that before. So this is our first if statement, and this is going to be, this is invalid. This is our value if false statement. This whole statement is going to become our value if false for a different if statement. Um, so let me write it out and hopefully that'll uh, make sense. But we're going to say if, we do open parentheses and we're going to do it like this. And let's just get rid of this for a second. All right. Uh, what did I do? And let me do, oops, give me a second. Okay, we have our if, let me just write that out again. We have our if, there we go. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna write basically the next part of it. So we're gonna say if that L2 is, and we're gonna do this time, we're gonna do greater than or equal to 31. So now it's gonna include that 31. So right here we did anything less than 31. So it's 30 and below. This one is gonna be 31 and above. So we're gonna say these people are middle age. And if not, then it's gonna to go to this if statement. And then we need to close it, I believe. So now let's try this. All right, fantastic. Now if um, everybody should be in one of these areas, right? Everyone should either be an adolescent or middle age, because basically all we're saying is, is if they're older than 31 or 30 or below. That's all these two statements do. So we have, um, you know, our next group. Now we can add and go even further into this. And now we can use this entire thing as the, um, what was it called? The value if false uh, section. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to do one more. So we're going to have three different categories. So we're going to say if and do uh, an open parentheses and we're going to say if oh actually let's do it um let's not do it to this one let's do it to this top one just easier 
Uh, so we're gonna say if, open parentheses, we're gonna say L2. And this time we're gonna say anybody over the age of 50. Uh, or we can do 55, let's do 55. So we'll do 55 and we're gonna call them old. And we'll do a comma, and this is the value if false statement and we need to close up parentheses. So let's try this. Anybody over the age of 55 should have old. Um, you know, maybe we'll do 54. So anybody who is 55 is considered old. I think that's fair. I think that's fair, guys. Oops, I should have done. Um, I should have done that to this one. Let me get out of this. And we'll do 54. Uh, my dad is 55. That's why I'm doing it like this. This is for you, dad. Because uh, he should be in this old category, to be fair. So now we have adolescent, adolescent, middle age, and old. These are our three categories. So we can now have these buckets, these different groups of ages, and it's much more usable than these individual ages. Um, and so we will be using this in our, in our dashboard for sure. Now our next one is the purchased bike. Uh, and we're not gonna do anything with that. So, uh, you know, that is, that is that one. And, you know, there wasn't a ton to clean up here. We removed some duplicates. Um, I don't know why it says that. What did I do? Married. Married. What does this mean even mean? I, did I write that? Did I mess this up, guys? Oh, when I did the M and the S uh, replacement in there, it replaced it with married and single. It's supposed to say marital status. Oops. Thanks for catching that, guys. Thanks for catching that. I hope that's how you spell marital. Uh, we'll see. So uh, we are going to keep it just like this. Now, what we are going to now. Now, what we are going to do is build pivot tables with this data. So we had our raw data. We have our working sheet. And now we want to create pivot tables. And pivot tables is how you actually help build your dashboards or help build your visualizations. So we're going to go right here. We're going to hit, whoops, let me get rid of that. We're going to go right here. We're going to insert and we're going to say pivot table. And it's going to ask us what range. So we're going to go back to the working sheet and we'll just click here and hit control A. This is going to select all of our data for us. So it's really easy and we're going to hit OK. And so now we have all of our uh, pivot. I don't, need, I don't need to pull it out that far. That was way too far. And now we have all of our pivot table information over here. And so that should make it really easy to, you know, actually build out. So what we're going to do is start selecting what columns and what data we actually want to work with. So the first one that we are going to build out is a dashboard that is basically looking at the average income of somebody who either bought or did not buy a bike. So we need in this one, we're going to need their income. That's definitely going to be a value right here. Um, but we want to break it out by male and female. So let's look at their gender. I'm going to pull that down into the rows. So um, this is basically a sum. And no, let's look at, uh, let's make this an average. So I just went to the, um, I clicked right here. I went to the value field settings. And we're just going to do an average. All right. And then we are going to make these. Um, and as you can see, there's four decimal points. Um, we'll keep it as is right now, but we may need to go back and change something. And then we're going to look at if they purchased a bike or not. And we're going to put that right here. So we can see that uh, right here for the people who did not buy a bike, the females, their, their average salary was 53,000. The average salary for the, the average salary for males was 56,000. For yes, the ones who did buy a bike, the average salary was 55 for female and 60 for male. So the people who had a little bit more money are buying bikes. And you can also see that uh, the men are making more money in this data set just overall in general. Um, so let's make the visualization really quick. But, you know, I don't know. I'm not a huge fan of these decimal points. And maybe we can just change that in the visualization. We'll see. Um, oops. That's not what I meant to do. Um, let's do that. So what we are going to do is we're going to click into here. We're going to click insert. And we're going to go to these recommended charts. And it's going to bring up basically every single type that we would want. Um, and we can just click in here and see which one looks good. Uh, oh, yeah. 
I love those 3D ones. Those are my favorite. You guys know that. Uh, let's click, let's use this one right here. Pretty simple. Um, whoops. Let's pull this right over here. And as is, it looks pretty good. Um, you know, it shows male, female. We have the average or the incomes right here, whether they did or did not purchase it. Um, and so at a glance, it's pretty easy to see. Let's see if there's anything, um, you know, if you want to change up style wise, go for it. I'm just going to keep it as is. Um, but let's see if there's anything we need to add, right? Do we want to add these access titles? Uh, for the most part, I, I tend to do that. Um, it makes it pretty easy to see. So we can go in here and we can just click it like this and we'll say income. And we'll say, oops, and we'll do gender. So that's what that is. And let's go back in here. Do we want to add a chart title? We definitely want to add a chart title. Uh, for most of these, we'll add a chart title for sure. So we'll say average income or purchase. Um, I don't know if that's 100% right, but we'll 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 use it uh, if we need to change it to be you know by gender or something. We can, but um, for now, let's see. Do we want to add data labels? Uh, definitely not. Uh, a data table. Um, we can do this. It may make it a little easier to read. I will say that again. These numbers are just these decimal points are really throwing me off. Let's go see if um, we can change it in here. Um, let's go to. Let's see if we can just make these numbers. Okay. And um, we can keep it like that, or we can even do something like this, add commas. Yeah, I'm going to keep it just like this. I, I think this just looks the best. Um, again, I'm I'm, at, I'm getting adding commas here. I, I'm changing the um, decimal place right here. It just makes it look a little nicer, a little cleaner. Um, so let's keep this exactly how it is. Um, we can always change things if we want to, uh, if we want to come back to it. So we created our pivot table and then we created our visualization, basically exactly what we're going to do for all of these. Cause again, all of these need, um, you know, all of these need pivot tables in order to create the visualization. So let's, um, get out of here. We are going to scroll down and we're going to create our next pivot table. And once we get done with all of the pivot tables that we need, uh, or all the visualizations that we need, then we will, um, we will start. So we're going to do control A. We're going to do OK and basically do the exact same thing that we did. Um, this time we're going to look at the distance. So for this one, I wanted to see, you know, I, I try to, you know, I created this already. I've already done this entire project through, but I haven't really talked about why or what we're going to look at. For this one, you know, we're looking at is their income? Does it change whether they bought or didn't buy one? Um, so if they said yes, you know, is there a reason? Are they making more money? Is, you know, our price points, are, are the customers, did they make more money? So you should we cater to them or not? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, another thing is, you know, we're, we sell bikes or this person sells bikes. So commuting distance definitely makes a difference. Or, you know, does the person who is buying a bike live one mile away from where they work or 20 miles away? Uh, this will help us determine, this next visualization will help us determine, you know, who, who is doing that or who's buying it. So what we're going to do is we are going to look at the um, that one that we were looking at earlier, the commute distance. So we're going to bring that right over here. So we have these, you know, one mile, 10 mile, 1.2, etc. Now we are going to, uh, again, we're going to look at if they purchased a bike. That's really important. And let's make that the column as well. So now what we have is a count of these no's and yeses, whether they did or did not buy a bike. Um, one of the issues that I already see, and we'll, I'm gonna visualize it and then I'll show you, that this 10 miles, you know, it's right next to the 0 0.1, so it's not an order. Um, and that could be, that could be an issue. Uh, so we may have to revise that somehow to put it at the very bottom, because we can either do ascending or descending uh, either one I don't think is going to work. So we may have to work through that in just a second. Um, I don't know if I did that in my, my plan for that. Um, yeah, so it has this big dip. Um, yeah, so let's let's create it. Um, that's okay. We're going to figure this one out together because I honestly, um, I didn't plan for this one. So, okay, we have 0 0.1 miles. That's exactly where it needs to be. The one, the two, the five. That's exactly where it needs to be. This 10 miles is not. 
And let's see if I change that 10, mi 10 plus miles to 10 miles plus. Let's see if that'll put it down here. Cause I, I don't know if it's looking at, I don't know if it's reading it weird. Um, but let's go into this working sheet and let's go right here. And we're gonna do control H and we'll do, oops, not this one. Um, 10 miles plus, let's get that in there. And we're gonna do 10 uh, miles plus. I, I don't know if that's actually gonna work. Um, we will see. So let's go back to the pivot table. Let's re go to the data. Let's refresh. Uh, no, it didn't, it didn't change it. Um, okay, so let's think about this. Maybe if we change it to like a letter, it might change down here. So start it with uh, miles. That could work. Um, let's try it. Okay, it's already selected. Let's do where's the 10 plus miles. Okay, so let's do um, my, uh, more than 10 miles. And we'll replace all. Let's get rid of this. Let's go to the pivot and refresh. All right. Okay, so it's not perfect, but it works. Um, and for what we're doing, I think we'll keep it how it is. So we have our second one. Uh, and, you know, there are different ways you can kind of change this one. Um, you know, on the last one, we did a ton of different stuff. We can do, um, just do commute distance. And we can say, what do we want to say on this one? What is this? Oh, this is the count. Um, do we have to, could do we have to keep this one? Um, no, there we go. I'm just going to do, um, just one and say commute distance and let's add a title chart title. We can make this one, um, let's say distance per customer. Uh, that's not hundred percent true because it's nowhere. Yes. Um, that's, that's the important part of this. It's distance, um, average distance. Uh, let's see. We'll just say customer com commute. All right. And we'll keep it just like that. All right. Perfect. I, I don't think, um, let me see. I don't think there's anything else we need to add on that one. All right, now let's go right down here. We're gonna create our very last one. Uh, we only have three, so, you know, sometimes you'll have a ton, sometimes you'll have like one on each sheet and you'll create multiple sheets, but um, do control A. Um, now we have our thing. Now, this one, we're gonna be looking at these age brackets that we were looking at, that we created. Um, something that I do honestly a lot uh, is, is kind of bracket things in, in the groups like this. And, you know, for this, I'm just kind of made them up, but, um, you know, it's good to know how to do this because I, I promise you this one happens a lot or I use this one a ton. And then we just want to look at who purchased a bike. Uh, so the same thing as we did before. So like purchase a bike, count of the purchase, um, you know, pretty easy. So we just have the count of either no or yes for these age ranges. Um, and let's go to the insert. We'll go to recommendation. Um, I personally like a good line for this one. Um, so let's, already, this is already interesting. If we do something like this, that's nice. See, this one versus this, it just adds a dot. Oh, it looks nice. We'll keep that one. Um, so just really quick at a glance, really interesting. People under the age of 30 are not buying that many bikes. Um, age 30 to 54. Four, uh, 31 to 54 buying a ton of bikes. Uh, they are, they buy more bikes or look at bikes more than anybody. Really interesting. Um, but you know, we'll make the dashboard a little bit. Um, let's make these chart titles. We'll do, uh, vert, oops, the horizontal, we'll just call this age bracket. Um, and then we'll add a chart title. Um, Again, you can add some extra stuff if you want to. Um, 
but you don't need to. Uh, none of this other stuff we really need. I'm just kind of looking at the stuff we do need or do want. Uh, so what do we want to call this one? Let's call it customer age brackets. Um, and it's not perfect, but we'll keep it as is. For comparison, um, let me see if I can copy um, or, or use this um, real quick. Instead of the age uh, brackets, I'm going to get rid of this and use the age. And then let's use, um, let's insert recommendation. We'll use a line and we we'll use this. So this compared to this, just think of it like if a customer or consumer or, or not a customer, uh, if somebody you're working with is trying to use this dashboard, understand this dashboard, this is going to be just, it's going to, I don't know, it might melt their brain. It just makes no sense. It makes sense. It's just all over the place. It's really hard to make sense of this. It really is. I mean, you can kind of see a pattern going up around like the mid thirties and then it trends downward, but it's hard to see. Um, it really is. So doing these, um, these brackets really helps. And you can even add, you know, adolescent, um, you know, zero to 30 underneath it. And in fact, we may want to do that. Um, why not? Why not? Let's do that. Oh, whoops. Um, so why don't, why don't we do that? Why don't we go back? I'm just going to, because I'm doing this on the fly. Why don't we go back? Uh, what am I doing? Whoops. And this is all calculated, but let's do adolescent zero to 30. Let's do middle aged 31 through 54 and then old 55 plus. Let's see if this breaks anything. I hope it doesn't. Um, and we'll go back to our pivot table. Let's refresh the data. Uh, okay, it did mess with stuff. Okay, never mind. Guys, that was a terrible idea. Don't do that. Um, <clears throat> perfect. Uh, let's get rid of that. That was a terrible idea. Don't do that. I'm glad we tested it out, though. I like I like to see if it was going to work. No, it messed with the um, the order of things. Um, I I intentionally named them adolescent, middle aged, and old because it's it it, it makes sense for the visualization. Um, <laughs> but you know, if if I change something and it messes with it. I'm not going to mess with it. It was just an idea on the fly, guys. Come on. All right, so let's start building out our dashboard. Now, um, when we're building our dashboard, what I personally like to do is to have this pivot table sheet, and then I will copy them over, and later we'll hide these other sheets, um, and I'll explain that in a little bit. But I like to have this, this one for us. So we're going to copy this. So I just click on it, hit Control-C. We're going to paste it right over here. Uh, let's just make them small for now. That's oh gosh, no, let's not do that. Oh, these look terrible. Okay, anyways, um, let's copy this one over. Oops. Okay, what did I just do? Oh, I didn't copy this one. Whoops. It's not copying. Okay, we're gonna go copy. Hit paste. Fantastic. Oops. Guys, look away. This is this is tough to watch. This is tough for me to watch. I'm the one doing it, and it's tough for me to watch. All right, let's go to this last one. I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try it again. All right, it worked this time. So now we have um, our, our three visualizations. This is perfect. But now we actually want to create a dashboard. Now, how do you do that? How do you make it look nice? Um, and then we're gonna add some you know filters and stuff like that. How do we make it look nice? Um, what happened here? What changed? What do we do? Oh my goodness gracious. All right, let's copy this. Let's paste this. Let's get rid of this. I don't even know how that happened. I've never seen that before. That was wild. Uh, Excel is trying to destroy my whole video. I mean, I'm doing this for you, Excel. Good night. Okay. No problem at all. What we're going to do and how you make this at least look nice. Um, First off, we can get rid of these grid lines pretty easily. And I recommend when you do that, when you make a dashboard, it just makes it look cleaner. It makes it look like an actual dashboard. Um, let's go to view and grid lines. So we can get rid of these grid lines. It just makes it look nicer. Um, we're going to make, 
you know, we can choose any color here. I'm just going to get choose a color. I like this. And let's we're, we're basically creating like a header, right? If you're using like Tableau or something, um, we're going to merge and center. So it takes every single cell that we have highlighted, creates it into one. Let's call this um, bike sales. Uh, I have I think I called it bike sales dashboard. Let's just call it that. Um, you know, see what happens. Let's get that. Let's make it white and make it much larger than it is. Okay. Okay. That, mm, sure. Let's do that. Doesn't look bad. Um, why, what is it doing? There we go. Uh, let's make that center. Perfect. Um, it's not perfect, but we're going to use it. All right. So now we kind of want to organize these and you know, everybody has their different way of doing it. Uh, I'm just going to start building it out myself and just see how it looks. Uh, and then we'll go from there. I like this one there. Um, we can put this one. I, I This one's a, kind of a longer one, so I'll probably put it at the bottom. Let's see how it looks. Um, but we'll put this one right here. Try to line it up. Jeez, let's, let's zoom in a little bit. Let's try to line this up, see what it looks like. Uh, let's extend it to the end. <clears throat> that doesn't look too bad. Uh, it needs to move up just a hair. Uh, and I'll show you how to kind of align these in a second, but um, <clears throat> that looks not bad. And we'll kind of try to align these as well. Let me zoom out and extend this the length of this just to make it look nice. Um, you know, now, what you can do, and you know, this is something that's pretty simple, is you can get both of these, and we're gonna go to shape format, and we can just align these. It's really nice to align, especially if like the top, um, and maybe like the left to right, but like we're gonna align these to the top, and they just kind of align themselves on the very top. Now these look much better. This one is a larger dashboard or a larger visualization, so I'm gonna keep it how it is, um, and I'm going to keep this one how it is. So it is going to be a little bit smaller, as you can tell. And then we'll have this one. Um, and I'm going to do that. Um, I, this is going to bother me if I don't align these. So let me do this. I'm going to shape format, align to the right. And it's not exactly what I wanted to happen because, oh, geez, what am I doing? That's not exactly what I wanted to happen. I actually wanted this one to align, uh, this one to align with this one. It did the opposite. Um, so let me just scoot this back. All right, visually it looks fine, but that's how you do it if you want to do it. Um, I, 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 if you have multiple of them like this, it, you can make it look bad. So we have our dashboards. This is already looking really good. I, I like how this looks. Colors are coordinated. It, we have a kind of a theme throughout. Um, and it looks nice. I actually, I actually kind of want to change this one um, to, um, let's see. I don't know, maybe if I did like that, it'd look nicer than all of them. Yeah, this does look nicer. Um, it doesn't change much either. Guys, I'm, should I do it? All right, we're going for it. We're changing the design on the fly. Should I do it for all of them? Let's see. It doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. Um, all right, guys, just ignore what I'm doing. Uh, don't do any of this. I'm, I'm just messing around at this point. So <clears throat> this is really great to have. It really is. And what we want to do is there are other elements. There are other things that people would like to be able to filter by and be able to look at, but it's not in this visualization. Um, to be more specific, one field that's could be really interesting is married versus single. Are single people buying more or... or um, married people buying more, you know, it, it'd be nice to filter on it. So we're going to click on uh, any of these actually, and we're going to go up to pivot chart analyze and we'll click insert slicer. Now we can choose which ones we want to be able to filter on all at the same time or one at a time. I'm just going to do the first one by itself and then I'll show you how to do other ones. Um, but this one is the marital status. So this is the married single, the one we were just looking at. And we can drag this right over here. All right, and we don't need all that space, so we're gonna boop, 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 all the way up. Now, while we're doing this, um, 
it only because we selected this uh, this visualization, it only is working on that one right now. We, of course, wanted to apply to all of them it is not hard to do. All we're going to do is we're going to click on. We're going to make sure we're clicking on this. We're going to go up to slicer. We're going to hit report connections. Um, and if you remember, we have this um, this pivot table that we're working with. Um, and this is where all of our pivots are coming from. So we're going to actually apply it to all of them. This is our sheet um, and this is the name of the pivot table. Now, again, we created that fourth one. We're not using it, but we're going to apply it to all of them. So now when we click on it, it's going to apply to all of them. So at a quick glance, let's see what single people are doing. Um, interesting. Interesting. Um, you know, when I'm looking at the just these numbers right here, married people, these individuals are making a lot more like eight. Um, sometimes eight to like 10,000 more on average uh, than their single counterpart. Um, you know, again, that's a rough estimate, but it's, it's interesting. So now what we can do is we're going to create more of these. So we're going to go to uh, pivot chart analyze. We're going to go to slicer. Now we already did marital status, but what if we want to look at things like uh, region and maybe something like their education? So let's bring up both of those and look now two of them come up. So let's add the region right here. Bring that in just a little bit. See if we can match it. Nailed it. All right, now we're going to put that up. We'll bring this one down just like this. Bring it over, see if I can match it again. Come on. Nay, almost nailed it. I don't know if I nailed it, but it's close. All right, kind of bring this up a little bit. Bring this up. And we have to do the exact same thing that we did with this one, because right now, again, it only applies to that one um, chart. So what we want to do is we want to go to slicer, report connections, add it to all of them. OK, do the same thing with education, report connections, bada bing, bada boom. We are looking good. And now uh, let's get rid of all of them. It's just going to be everybody. So now we can kind of slice and dice and choose what we want. We want to look at people who have a bachelor's degree, who live in Europe and are single. And this is the information that we have on those people. So now we can narrow it down by certain demographics even further and look at this key information. So we may not, you know, look at counts and averages of these things, but we're able to filter on them. Uh, and that's really great to know. So bachelor's degrees on average are making 60s, 70,000. Um, let's look at, um, let's look at graduate degrees. Okay, a little more. Um, but, you know, again, I'm just looking at random stuff, um, but you can mess around with this. Take a look at some stuff. Um, this to me, I want to make this color darker. I feel like it'd look nicer, darker. There we go. Oh, yeah, that's way better. This to me is it's a good dashboard, right? You have key information that you're looking at. Nice visualizations. It's color coordinated. You have these slicers on the side. Um, to me, this is a fantastic, just simple dashboard. And there are so many other things that you can do with this data and you can make it unique and you can add your own spin on it. And I highly recommend that you do that. Push yourself, go past what we just did today and add your own stuff and, and use this. And then you can add this to your portfolio website and show this off and show people that you know how to use Excel, which is a fantastic thing to know how to use and show off. So. With that being said, I hope that this project was helpful. I hope that you learned something along the way. I know I did. Um, I was learning things as we were going, and I hope that you didn't mind that I took some detours along the way um, for your amusement as well as my learning. Uh, so with that being said, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. I hope you have a good day, and goodbye.